Welcome to Trinity Radio, and just look at yourself. You found the Christian channel that loves atheists, and today we're doing something a little different. We're going into some theology and some stuff that has to do with the doctrine of salvation, the problem of evil, and really just a lot of metaphysical ideas that are super interesting and fun to talk about. I invite you, even if you're not a believer and might not think this is very relevant to you, to uh, listen in and see what it's like for Christians to think deeply about some of the issues that are that, that we find to be some of the most difficult issues when we study Christian theology. We're going to be looking at a debate between Kirk McGregor, the Molinist, and uh, Guillaume Bignon, who is the Calvinist. These are philosophers and theologians, and Guillaume, the Calvinist, wrote a book that is um, becoming more well-known all the time, and it has it is a defense of uh, a philosophical idea that, that is often involved in Calvinism called compatibilism. And this is, compatibilism, just kind of giving you a fresher if you're, if you're not used to these discussions, uh, compatibilism is um, the, the notion that determinism, the idea that you don't have the sort of libertarian freedom that some people, free will that some people think they have, uh, but determinism rather, the idea that 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 uh, everything that you do has been determined or predetermined either by nature or by God on theistic determinism. And uh, they think that idea, determinism, is compatible with a meaningful sense of talking about freedom and moral responsibility. You can be morally responsible, even if it's the case that you um, that your choices, beliefs, decisions were all determined by God um, b before time began. So we're going to look at that debate as the Molinist, the, the, the non-Calvinist who takes the position that God is aware of all the ways that he could make or all the ways that things could go with libertarian creatures, free creatures who really have free will, um, of the sort that they could have done otherwise or nothing external to them determined what they were going to do, that, uh, this guy's going to present an idea that those, uh, that position, that God looks at all of these possible ways the world could have been and selects among those the one that he knows um, best fits whatever purposes he has. And that means that he's going to have to select a world that uh, there may be no world where man has free will, and yet there's no evil or pain or suffering. And so perhaps that explains why the world has the level of suffering and pain that it has in it. But to cover this debate today as they just talk about how they address the problem of evil, why is why would a loving God allow pain and suffering like we have? As they talk about how Calvinists and Molinists will answer that question, I brought in a Molinist all my own. I'm a Molinist myself, but I brought someone in who's a full-time Molinist, and I'm going to bring him on the screen right now if I can figure out how to do it. Welcome, Dr. Tim Stratton and tr professor at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary. Hey, Braxton. Uh, thanks for having me on the show again. And uh, I'm honored to, to to be a professor at Trinity and also to Heck be a yeah, full-time Molina. Heck yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're honored to have like you, Tim. A no, no. Well, I was just going to say that this uh, debate... Um, you mentioned that there's non-believers and atheists watching. And I think this is a debate, an, an in-house debate among Christians that atheists should really care about. Because I think uh, my understanding of Christianity can, can answer their questions and solve their problems. I don't think uh, the Calvinist uh, view can do that, especially uh, the exhaustive divine determinism view. But this is what Kirk McGregor and Guillaume Bignon were discussing in this debate. And so you and I just thought, hey, this would be a great uh, debate to discuss. I got to tell you, Tim, I loved this debate. I really did. I enjoyed it. Um, obviously, in any debate on issues that you like to talk about, there are moments where you kind of are screaming at your phone saying, why doesn't right. somebody say this? You know, but honestly, in this one, there wasn't much of that because I thought mm -hmm. I, I know there's some things we're going to point out here that we think are important. But um, Kirk McGregor and Guillaume were just uh, 
well suited for this. I think they they got yeah. along well. They weren't afraid to say harsh things, but there was obviously a jovial tone to all, to it. It's right. one of the reasons why I really admire both of these guys, um, mm -hmm. not only for their academic prowess, but also for their ability to interact on issues that can be emotionally charged and just just look at the issues and be friends about it. I thought that was pretty cool, yeah. and I, I greatly admire them both. Man, I I totally agree with you. I'd like to take a moment just to sing the praises of both of these guys. Uh, let me start out with a guy that I disagree with. Uh, in my opinion, Guillaume Bignon is a top shelf philosopher. And I just got to say that I'll never be that much, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, in, in fact, I got to tell you, Braxton, I mean, uh, you, you might want to let me go after I, I say this, but I don't even consider myself to be, you know, an official academic. Uh, I, I kind of got into this whole academic thing through the back door. It was never really my intention. Uh, you know, it wasn't my intent to find myself swimming in these waters, um, uh, to mix metaphors with these highly trained professional philosophers. You know, I was, yeah, I was that may be that. Guy. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I'll I was just going to say that, that I, I understand that, uh, level of humility and you certainly do uh, approach things with, um, an, an every man sort of way when it comes to explaining things to people, you explain things in, in a way that I think people who have no exposure to academics can pick things up. And that's one of the things that one of the reasons God's used you, but I mean, you may not feel like an academic, but it's a fact of reality that by any particular measure, you're an academic. <laughs> well, I, I don't feel like one. I, I was simply a guy that really struggled to get through high school. You know, I was on the basketball team and the coach was, always warning me that I wasn't going to be able to suit up for the next game because my grades weren't good enough. <laughs> uh, did well, really I was that way too, Tim, but like, did they, did they but, teach Molinism at your school? Was that one of the things you all discussed and talked <laughs> about? Because it probably wasn't. And I know you're probably like me yeah. that when they finally gave you stuff to study that you enjoy, it was straight A's. Right. Well, yeah. And I got to tell you, I mean, really struggling through high school, even struggled through my undergrad, by the way, at, uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney, got to wear my shirt. That's where I did my, my undergrad. <clears throat> um, I still do ministry there today. What but are they, the, the yellow, what, what's on your too. shirt? Is it, is it goat? Uh, it's the, a loper, an antelope. The yellow lopers, is that what they're called? <laughs> Go yellow lopers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're blue and gold, so there you go. Um, the libertarian lopers. Not, they are libertarian <laughs> lopers uh, in the land of the free. Um, but... <laughs> Come on, man. You're throwing me way off. I'm trying to say some yeah. nice things about Guillaume. Yeah, yeah. Talk about Guillaume. Guillaume's <laughs> yeah, libertarian, no, I, I too, whether Guillaume's libertarian, too, whether he's aware of it or not. Well, I agree with that. I do agree with that much. Um, now, I was just going to say, you know, I was a Christian at a very young age. But when I dedicated my life to Christ, when I, I when I said I was going to be a Jesus freak, uh, that's when everything changed. And I started getting uh, really good grades after that. I was around 20 uh, years old at the time at UNK. Um, but anyway, I, I still don't feel like uh, an academic. I kind of got, got into this whole thing through the back door. So needless to say, I know uh, I've not arrived and I'm still learning the rules of academia, <laughs> it seems to me. And sometimes I make some mistakes along the way, but I'm having a lot of fun in the process. And I try to bring others along with me when I learn more about God. But with that said, uh, I, I have studied these topics probably more than most theologians and philosophers. And I've, you know, I've literally spent hours and hours every day over the past decade studying these topics. Now, let me talk about Guillaume Bignon. He's probably spent the same amount of time studying these topics, if not more. Mm. And he probably got into philosophical theology through the front door, as opposed to me going through the back door. And this is why I take Bignon seriously. I, I do believe he's offered the best defense of Calvinistic compatibilism um, in the world today uh, in, in his book, Excusing Sinners and Blaming God. So I encourage people to read his book and especially his new one uh, called Confessions of a French Atheist. Now, uh, so yeah, all that to say, I highly respect Guillaume Bignon and uh you know, I, I want him to know that. I don't know if he knows that I feel that way about him, but I really do. Um, and I'm just trying to have a, a cordial and academic 
discussion with him and, and have some pushback and and that's all now let me talk about Kirk McGregor. I don't agree with everything that Kirk says, but he and I are both Molinists. Uh, there was a couple of things he said in the in the debate where I disagreed with him, um, but by and large, I agreed with the vast majority of what he said, and I thought he made some great points. I think Bignon made some great points too. Um, but Kirk McGregor is a philosopher who I've learned so much from over the past decade, and he's literally written the book on Luis de Molina and knows so much about libertarian freedom and divine middle knowledge. So I encourage you to get his book, uh, the, his biography on Luis de Molina. And, you know, he's kind of taken me under his wing and even he, he wrote the foreword uh, to my book. Here it is. Um, and Kirk's name is on the cover. So thank you. Awesome. Kirk. <clears throat> um, but, uh, you know, I, I just got to say, I'm currently working on the second edition of that book. It's going to be way bigger and much bigger and stronger. Uh, really looking forward to that. I've, I've completely gutted chapter 12 and replaced it. And I think Guillaume uh, will be very interested in that because uh, I, I uh, talked about him in chapter 12. And uh, it's going to be a little bit different take this time. So anyway, stay tuned for that. But here's the bottom line. Both well, wait, before, but, but, oh, you're going to say something about the two of them. I was going to say, if you don't think that this debate was a party, let me just show you what happened. Look at, look at these men. They could not be more happy. These are yeah. not enemies. These are brothers. Right. And it looks like, yeah. it looks like something that some frat boys would enjoy being part of <laughs> from the way it looks right there. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Great guys. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely loved the tone of this debate. Yeah. It was by it was completely different than the tone uh, that was in you know that I found myself in debating Doctor uh, James White. Um, it was a different tone. Really was it? A, it was a different tone. I didn't yeah. really have fun. I I guess I mean it, to me it was more of a it felt like more of a fight. <laughs> um, I mean I love I love Doctor White. I know he loves me. But it just, I didn't like the tone. Part of that was probably my fault. Uh, I was just really nervous, that being my first debate on that stage. All that to say. Maybe it was, Tim, I, but do you, do, do you, do you, like, I feel like you're being humble there. I, I, I mean, you are being humble. I feel like, I don't know if James White's going to say, maybe it was my fault that it felt a little aggressive. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but in any case, you're being a gentleman and I would want nothing less from our professors. You're fantastic and you performed well. And who cares if you talked about superheroes? We talk about superheroes here all the time. So well, we're uh, going to talk about them tonight. So let's do it, man. Well, let's let, let's move yeah. forward, man. I'm, I'm excited about this. Yeah, I'll just say that both Kirk McGregor and Guillaume Bignon, I consider them both to be philosophical juggernauts. And uh, when they speak, their words ought to be carefully considered. And so that's what we're going to do today. Right on. All right. So we're going to jump into the video and take a look at what Guillaume had to say. Problem of evil. Now, there's a number of different things that are called the problem of evil. So we'll see if we tackle several different versions of that. Uh, maybe maybe a, a good starting point uh, would be the classical problem of evil as an argument from the atheists against the existence of God, uh, which goes that like this. If God is all powerful, he can prevent all evil. And if God is all good, he wants to prevent all evil. And so if he can and he wants, then he does. But in fact, he doesn't. And so he's not there. Right. That's the, the gist of the argument from the atheist against God's existence. Yeah. All right, Tim. What are your thoughts? Well, I've, I've interacted with a version um, of this argument, which was offered to me by an atheist years ago. And so this the ar argument that was given to me is one that I've really been wrestling with um, for, I don't know, probably eight years now. Um, and, and, it, and I think it's a little bit stronger than the one that uh, uh, Guillaume just offered because it really focuses on the uh, what I refer to as the big three of God's omni attributes. So it would go like this, uh, premise one, uh, God by definition is omnibenevolent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Two, if God is omnibenevolent, which means all good and perfectly loving, then he desires to prevent all evil. Three, if God is omnipotent, he has the power to prevent all evil. Four, if God is omniscient, 
He knows how to prevent all evil. Five, the world is suffused with evil. Six, therefore God is either not omnibenevolent, not omnipotent, or not omniscient, or perhaps none of the above. Well, seven, therefore God, by definition, does not exist. So the problem with this argument is that if God is omnibenevolent or a God of love, then God desires to create a world where the best kind of love is possible. However, I've argued at length in my book and on my website and on my YouTube channel that, uh, and in a journal article, that um, I, I've argued at length that this requires libertarian freedom. The best kind of love requires libertarian freedom. And thus, the same power that allows humans to experience the best kind of love is the same power that allows humans to, uh, to do and commit moral evil. Now, <clears throat> Bignon has often said that libertarian freedom or the free will defense is only applicable to the problem of moral evil. But I have applied it to all kinds of afflictions. I think we can solve um, uh, all the problems of evil. And, and I'd be remiss if I took the credit since the Apostle Paul, I think, implies this much in 1 Corinthians 4.17. I really did get the, this whole concept came into my head after reading um, the words of Paul. When, when Paul says these light momentary afflictions prepare us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And Paul wasn't just talking about uh, moral evil here. He, Paul he provides a whole long list of all of these afflictions, all this pain, evil, and suffering uh, uh, that he was experiencing. But then he says that these are light momentary afflictions and then uh, says that they prepare us for eternity. And so I've really uh, worked with that and um, gone into more depth and detail. So I encourage people to read it in my book or uh, my other work to, to see what I mean by that. But, um, but I do have an argument that is in the last chapter of my book. Um, and it's a deductive argument uh, summarizing all of this uh, and really kind of inspired by 2 Corinthians 4.17. And I call it uh, Molinism versus all the problems of evil. And so, uh, yeah, that goes a little bit something like this. Premise one, if God is omnibenevolent, then he desires genuine eternal love relations with humans. Two, if God desires genuine eternal love relations with humans, then he creates humans with libertarian freedom because 2.1, a genuine eternal love relationship between God and humans necessarily requires that humans possess libertarian freedom. Premise three, if God creates humans with libertarian freedom, then he allows humans to experience suffering because 3.1, Suffering can result from libertarian free humans. And 3.2, God created a world in which he knew that unless he permitted all kinds of evil, some would not freely choose to eternally persevere, or, or I'm sorry, to eternally preserve the suffering free states of a the suffering free state of affairs in the new heavens and the new earth. And I put 2 Corinthians 4:17. 4, For God is omnibenevolent. Five, therefore, God, since he is omnibenevolent, allows humans to experience suffering. So you'll see that this argument makes use of all three of the essential ingredients of the soteriological view of Molinism that I discuss in my book. So this is more than just mere <clears throat> Molinism. This is a soteriological view of Molinism. And it makes use of this argument makes use of one, human libertarian freedom, two, uh, God's middle knowledge, and three, the omnibenevolence of God. So it's important to see that no rival view of God's sovereignty has logical access to this specific argument. And with God's eternal, uh, eternal intent in mind, it's easy to see that God is not a morally guilty mind. And this came up in their debate. Uh, that is to say, the concept of mens rea does not apply to God if Molinism is true. So what do you think about all that, Braxton? No, I... Naturally, I agree with this argument. Um, I feel compelled to voice the one objection that commonly comes, to, and this would affect, I think, if not just one, maybe more than one of your premises, and that is uh, the notion that, okay, uh, Dr. Stratton, you're here telling us that we should drop Calvinism, drop determinism, because the highest form of love requires libertarian freedom, and yet we had the mutual love within the Trinity 
in a timeless state sans creation. Uh, yeah. So how, how do you um, how do you work with all of that? It does, first of all, you, it would seem like you'd have to argue because I noticed in the premise here, Tim, you and I'm just interested because I'm sure you've thought through all this. This is not me trying to get you. I, I'm actually genuinely interested about how you handle this because I noticed you mentioned in um, 2.1 premise 2.1. A genuine eternal love relationship between God and humans necessarily requires that humans possess libertarian freedom. Uh, it's as a, when I think about writing arguments, it seems like you intentionally specified humans instead of D and you're, and I imagine you're trying to not deal with that question about God's, the nature of God's freedom when we're trying to focus on this and all we need for this is human freedom. But then it makes me wonder, okay, I know Tim affirms that God has libertarian freedom of a sort, at least in the source sense yeah. that nothing he does, no, nothing external to him determines his choices. But um, in other words, it seems like maybe there'd be have to be some support to get me on board as a Calvinist with the notion that I would have to believe in freely given love when when even if I adopted human libertarian free will as the argument requires. I might think of the counter example of God because in the Trinity, I don't yet believe you haven't yet given me an argument to think that God has libertarian freedom. Yeah. Uh, and so first of all, uh, Kirk McGregor gave a fantastic argument for God's libertarian freedom during the debate and uh, Guillaume Bignon never uh, rejected it. Uh, <laughs> didn't even try. Oh, um, it was so, fantastic. I'm sorry. I know we kind of have a little bit of structure to this because we have what, what we want to cover. But oh my gosh, Tim, you're absolutely right. Because um, I listened to two or three debates <laughs> this weekend, but I'm thinking it's the one where he said he basically argued from the bottom to the top. Basically, if at the lowest levels, there's not yeah. free will, then there's not free will at the top levels. And he was doing a parody, I think, of something maybe in Guillaume's book from what he said. Does that sound right? Uh, yeah, I think something along those lines. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, Kirk gave a, a fantastic argument being on in the past has made claims that he wasn't sure if God even had libertarian freedom and didn't, you know, and he said things to the effect that he didn't think it would be that much of, you know, wouldn't be that big of a deal if he didn't. And I've argued otherwise, it would be a big deal if God didn't have libertarian freedom. In fact, I've offered those arguments in my book as well, but Kirk gave a different uh, an argument with a different spin to it. But to answer your question about my argument, I, uh, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. So when we're talking about the ability to do otherwise, I don't think God has the ability not to love. That's just his nature. God is love and he loves, uh, you know, each person of the Trinity loves the other persons of the Trinity. Uh, each person of the Trinity loves every other person ever created. Um, I would argue that God even loves Satan, right? But Satan hates God. So, uh, you know, um, but, but you can't force love upon a person. That's in intuitively obvious. Now, what I do, and I've, I've talked about this on my website, I think in an article called The Best Kind of Love. Um, I could be wrong on that, but... No, I've read uh, the article. I do remember that now that you mentioned okay. it on Freethinker, yeah. yeah. So here's the, here's the deal. Uh, love can't be forced upon somebody else or on someone by somebody else. So, but God is love by nature. It's not forced upon him by something or someone else. Now, if God gave us a loving nature, <laughs> it would be forced upon us by God. So he can't do that. So he's got to give us the ability to do otherwise, I believe. Mm. Uh, but God is free in the source sense. Uh, nothing is uh, determining him to love other people. He's just loving by nature. So, But God can't, uh, can't force us to freely love. That's impossible. That's like trying to make a... Uh, create, create a married bachelor. So God gives us libertarian freedom so we can resist his love or not. So I would just point people to that article uh, to get started. And I've no, this, uh, done I'm looking at the other premises that. right now. I'm not looking away and ignoring you. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I would want to look at it further, but it looks good to me. And, and with that clarification, I think we got a strong argument here. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So go ahead, continue. What, what's the next thing that, uh, 
comes to mind. Are we ready to go to the next clip? I think we might be. Yeah, let's go to the next clip. Yeah. Okay, let's do that now. The argument from the atheist against God's existence. And in that light, uh, Christians have known to respond with uh, two different things. Uh, one is to say that God may not get all he wants, uh, even though he's omnipotent, uh, because indeterministic free will choices may turn out to fall on the wrong side, right? So it's a use of free will as an answer to the problem of evil to say, God cannot determine the outcome of human choices, otherwise they would not be free, uh, because free will and determinism are not compatible. That's the incompatibilist position. Uh, and so that's, that way God, even though he's omnipotent, cannot determine the outcome of our choices. So some of those fall on the wrong side. And so that's how we have evil, even though God really wishes that it didn't happen. It's just free will uh, brings it about. Um, and then the, the second response that's given by Christians traditionally is that um, even if God gets all he wants, uh, he may not necessarily want uh, they are not to be any evil, uh, even though he's perfectly good, uh, because there may be greater goods that necessitate the existence of evil, right? So evil might be a necessary means to the end of securing some greater goods uh, that couldn't be secured without evil. So, okay, uh, <clears throat> Tim, you know, you have things to say about this. Uh, oh, I keep having trouble here. Okay. You know, Tim, you have some things to say about this, obviously, but um, let me see if I understand just for the audience to know. And let me see if I understand for you to tell me what McGregor's response later is to this point. Basically, it seems like the response is something like you are acting like you can use greater good arguments, but greater. But for the audience, greater good is when you say in response to why would a loving, all knowing God, all powerful God allow some particular instance of suffering when he could prevent it and a loving God would want to prevent it. Right. And so a greater good argument is any or theodicy or defense or whatever is any response that tries to say the reason God did or permitted actualized or permitted this evil was for some greater good that could only be achieved in some way. It's like you imagine the evil being bound to the good. So the only way yeah. you get the good is if you uh, allow the evil. And so <clears throat> Guillaume is here saying, uh, yeah, that uh, we we can say that too. Calvinists can say that too. And McGregor wants to say, I, I don't see how you can because on your view, God could have determined that everyone do exactly the right thing all the time. Is that basically right. what you got from that? Yeah, and you know that's something uh, I, I even brought that up in my debate with James White. That exact point: uh, God could have had perfection from the beginning. He could have had a hundred percent glory from you know everybody could have glorified him. Uh, there could have been no evil. It seems you could have had heaven from the beginning. Yeah, um, and and Tim, humanism. on top of that, you have like I remember Jerry Walls way back, like like seven or eight years ago, saying in his speech at Houston Baptist, he was talking about why why Calvinism is false or whatever he said, and uh, and he was saying that you know he pointed out that you, what you and I probably talk about all the time now, but at the time it was news to me that or I didn't think about it that on compatibilism, of course, right? They they talk about free will, and if you're new to this, right. you should know that Calvinists believe in free will. They just don't believe in free will like the way w that non-Calvinists believe in it. What we call libertarian free will. They believe in um, a, a view called compatibilism that says, okay, well, determinism is true, but somehow we can, you know, you can still have a meaningful sense of freedom even if all your beliefs and actions are determined and morality and uh, all those kind of things. But he pointed out then, Walls pointed out then, well, yeah, if you want to talk about free will on compatibilism, then what that means is on your view, God could have, uh, God could have determined it such that everyone freely, on your view yeah. of freedom, everyone freely does exactly what they should. Right, right. Yeah. And that's why I spend most of my time focusing on determinism. Does my interlocutor affirm determinism? And that's the view that antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate um, well, an event is determined if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate the event. So then if one wants to say that everything is determined, then you would say antecedent determined or antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate all effects. And when I talk about exhaustive divine determinism, I'm primarily focused on uh, God, either via his decree or the initial conditions of the universe that he created or whatever. Uh, that there, there are these antecedent conditions up to God that are sufficient to necessitate 
everything about the human, including what, what you're you saying. Think about ba him. Am I truncating it too much? You're using the proper academic terms, even though you're not an academic, according to you. But um, but but to put it on the on the bottom shelf, aren't you basically saying that determine that when we're talking about this kind of determinism, we're talking about something external to the agent? And if within the agent, we would just mean biology and stuff that you're not consciously in control of stuff right. external to the agent um, determined what the agent would do. And it, since you had necessity, it, it couldn't have been otherwise. It had to right. be this way. <laughs> it yeah. could, in one sense of had, right. It had to be this way. Yeah. 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 In, in the world that God created, it had to be this way. And, and we could say, Oh, you could, you know, in the last, uh, interview, the last time you and I talked, um, we talked about the conditional, uh, ability to do otherwise versus the categorical ability to do otherwise. And the categorical ability to do otherwise is in the specific circumstance in which you find yourself um, with nothing changed as far as antecedent conditions go. You can do one thing or the other as far as, you know, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you can uh, sin or you can take the way of escape. There's two uh, alternative possibilities there. They're actually available. You, you have access to both of them in that specific circumstance. Now, the conditional view of alternative uh, possibilities or the ability to do otherwise basically boils down to this. You could have done otherwise if God would have determined you to do otherwise. And I just say big deal. Uh, nobody cares about that. Kind you know, of, you said that better, ability. Tim, than I think I've heard it said last time when you were on here. Yeah. And, and basically it was that. It was basically like, what do you, what's that say? Like, what's that do for us? Right. And I yeah, thought that was really yeah. good. Yeah. I don't know if you know, I clipped out a smaller clip of just the part about that passage and shared I it. Saw that. Yeah. I saw yeah. That. Because that was so powerful and you just said it so well. Well, thank you. Well, I just want to say that I think Vignon was right in that last clip, however, uh, in, in a sense, but here's, here's what's important to know. The Molinist can specifically explain what these greater goods are and why they require libertarian freedom. Now, the Ed Calvinist, the, the, when I say Ed, I mean exhaustive divine determinism. So the Ed Calvinist, which uh, is Guillaume's position, he typically uh, appeals to mystery, right? So the Molinist can tell you what these important goods are and explain why uh, we need libertarian freedom. And then the, the Calvinist is going to punt to mystery. So you have to start thinking, okay, well, what's the best explanation? One that can actually explain or one in which you say, I don't know, mystery, punt the ball. Um, so, uh, so what are these important goods that require libertarian freedom, uh, which allow evil to then come along for the ride? Now, I think there's several, but I'll give you two. Uh, number one, as I said earlier, the best kind of love into the infinite future requires libertarian freedom. Uh, I've made that case elsewhere. And uh, what I spend a lot of my time discussing is rational humans, at least important kinds of rationality, require libertarian freedom. And J.P. Moreland and I have an entire paper uh, coming out very soon, um, which is going to make that case much stronger than I've ever made it in the past. But I have made the case in the past. So anyway, I think we're going to hear Bignon appeal to mystery in the next clip. So let's take a look at that. OK, sounds good to the end of securing some greater goods uh, that couldn't be secured without evil. Here we so go. These are the two typical responses that challenge the premises of the argument from the atheist against God's existence. Now, technically, both of those responses can be phrased in a single response that encapsulates both of those. And it's to say that God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing evil. And one such reason may well be to give us this indeterministic free will that uh, ends up causing a great deal of evil, but that really can be seen as a subset of the more general response that says God has morally sufficient reasons for allowing evil. Uh, and of course, the, the add on to this response is to say that just because we don't know what those reasons are, at least not in every single specific case, it doesn't follow that God cannot have those purposes behind evil, right? So that's, uh, there's this aspect of not knowing which ones they are, but having to simply maintain there are good reasons. And so there's a, a component of trust here from the believer. All right, Tim, 
How are you going to deal with that? I mean, it sounds beautiful. You trust God, right? I mean, that's what we think when we right. use those kind of, when we're dealing with atheists, we, we have to say, look, we may not always know um, what the particular reason God allows a particular thing, right? Uh, so, so can he use that in this case? And what's going on here? Well, I think it's important to, to see a, a few key points here. Um, so first, uh, Guillaume mentioned that component of trust. But think about this, if, if Ed is true, if, if exhaustive divine determinism is true, which is Guillaume's view, um, those who trust God are determined by God to trust God. And those who do not trust God are also determined by God not to trust him. So this component of trust is not something we actively choose to put our faith in on his view, but rather we on on ed we passively find ourselves trusting or not trusting right so this component of trust or this component of faith on the ed calvinist view is never up to the human right we're not the source it's up to something or someone else it's up to god on ed and it and, and this chain of events passes through us and god decides who this chain of events passes through um, whether it be a chain of events that uh, determines us to uh, feel like we have faith <laughs> or a chain of events that determines otherwise, but none of it is up to us. So again, trust just happens to us on this ed view. It's not an active choice we make. And so I just wanted to point that out, but really that's not the big deal. Um, not the main point that I want to focus on. The main issue I want to draw attention to here um is this and i've already alluded to it uh today and that's that the molinist knows exactly what the reasons are right we can go score a touchdown but the calvinist has to punt to mystery so the best explanation right uh, did you come up with that wait, wait a minute wait a minute back up did you come up with that oh uh i've heard other people say punt to mystery before but I i've guess, heard like, punt to mystery but i've never yeah. heard we can score a touchdown they have to point <laughs> punt to mystery oh that is i'm gonna make a t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> cool <laughs> go ahead well, tim i'm sorry yeah i i mean i, I just want to say well what's the best explanation um i mean i think we can rule out exhaustive divine determinism but until we do that let's just say we've got two competing explanations What's the best? The one that can specifically explain what all of these goods are, or one that just says, well, we've got goods, but who knows what they are? Well, I'm going to take the former all day long. And I think any what? rational theist. And you know, Tim, I, like if it was all ad hoc, if, if, I, if I felt like all of the um, answers given by Molinists or whoever else were just ad hoc and they were just going way beyond the evidence, they just like, went, you know, took a bridge too far. Well, then, yeah, I would find the more uh, wise position to be the position that says, look, I don't know, but I know there's a reason. The thing is, the, the thing that we're saying is the motivator behind it. Um, first of all, we have multiple arguments, including this one that Kurt McGregor added, the love one that you yeah. gave and the rational one that you give about rationality and human rationality and all those things. But we also have this extreme intuition, at least that many of us have um, mm -hmm. about this. Uh, so it, it kind of, it, it's not like it's just, we came up with some ad hoc explanation that we like and, and no one's, I mean, these guys aren't saying that, but it's the notion that what we're saying would actually provide all these extra answers that give us that satisfaction. It's not just that we want that itch of having answers scratched. It's that the, the thing that we immediately thought was the answer actually satisfies all of this when you plug it in and all of the grid lights up like it should. You know, at least that's how we Molinists feel. Yeah, that's right. I mean, Molinism has uh, more explanatory, explanatory power, explanatory scope. Uh, it seems to be simpler at the end of the day, and it's by far less ad hoc. And it also, this is what's really cool. It provides so much illumination as it helps to answer so many other tough theological questions. You know, I've already uh, offered a... a an argument uh, doing that with all the problems of evil. So Molinism, as I said in the last sentence of my book, is the best explanation of all the data. Um, so now, now the Molinist says that God has a morally sufficient reasons to allow evil. 
and they are one true love and two important kinds of rationality that I've argued and others have as well that you know both of these things require libertarian freedom and libertarian freedom then makes finite evil possible that will eventually come to an end at least for the citizens of heaven so it seems to me that the calvinist wants access to the Molinist toolbox as it were and and says yeah we agree that god has morally sufficient reasons uh not and not to merely allow evil um i mean the Molinist says that god allows evil but then they say that, well god has morally sufficient reasons to determine and necessitate evil but who knows what they are now i want i want people to focus on the difference between allow and necessitate um even guillaume i believe in the debate would use allow language well he he should not use that kind of language on his view god determines and necessitates evil and, and i would argue by way of cause and effect guillaume might say that causation is a morass <laughs> well I, I will make an argument uh for that if need be but the molinist says that god allows evil and explains uh this uh how that works that god merely allows it but the calvinist determinist has to say that god determines and necessitates evil and that says but god has good reason to determine and necessitate evil but who knows what they are i just don't think that's a good explanation and, and i don't think that it makes any sense to say that god has good reason to determine evil to get some greater good when an omnipotent god could simply determine the ultimate good from the beginning as you and i were discussing earlier so anyway here's the takeaway the Molinist has specific explanations about what God's morally sufficient reasons are, and the Calvinist doesn't. Moreover, we can make a case that a deity of determinism can get a world of zero suffering and universal salvation and all the glory he could possibly ever want simply by his sheer power from the very beginning. So what do you think, Braxton? I like it now. I mean, I, I'm convinced by it, but I but I want to uh, push back in in this way and say, well, what would you do? Like, so for all of us who interact with arguments from evil that atheists will bring, um, you know, you you kind of get to this place where you recognize, like, okay, here's one of the goods uh, uh, that you get, or the, here are some of the goods that you get from a world with evil that you can't get without a world with the evil, like. Um, the ability to demonstrate sacrifice or courage. You know, maybe we could still get some of those things in, to a lesser degree um, in a world without evil or suffering, but it, it, it sure wouldn't be as dramatic as we seem to have it. It's why we like to watch action movies. It's why we like to watch, because well, any movie, really, well, even if it's a kid's movie, there has to be some, um, there has to be some evil or, or confusion or darkness that has to be dealt with. And so... Um, and, and I find that to be helpful. So if I were a Calvinist, could I not say, okay, I take your point, Dr. Stratton, about God determining evil. And as uh, Guillaume was trying to say it, I think in the most neutral way, um, he has some, that sounds like he might have some more involvement in evil than he should. But uh, but on the other side of the coin, we can still say, you're, you can't take this away from us, Dr. Stratton. God is painting a picture, and a beautiful picture might have some dark corners and some bright spots and, uh, you know, all those kind of things, but, but that's a beautiful picture. So can we at least have that when it comes to the problem of you? Why are you trying to take everything away from us? Yeah, I mean, if, uh, if I think it's theologically problematic to say that God needs evil. Um, I think you and I talked about this, uh, and, or no, I was talking with uh, Dan Chapa about this. Yeah, um, and I heard it though, because you were saying yeah. what we what we often say about other things, which is you're saying, well, look, that means God needs. You even said it well, needs creation and needs sin in order to yeah. flush out some of these incredible, glorious right. features that he, or attributes. That he right. Has. Yeah, that makes God a needy God, and uh, and, and then. He can't even refrain from creation. If God's needy, he has to create and create evil, make evil happen, uh, necessitate evil to happen. Um, John Piper has taken a, a similar view. I discussed this in my book. 
Um, I've got a, a journal article that I co-authored with the Equibus Erasmus um, talking about the problems of, uh, of, of this view. Um, God, you know, and, and if God was this needy, he wouldn't have to have all this pain, evil, and suffering in the world. Uh, he could just let Satan um, be the one that he torments in, into the infinite future and uh, keep everybody else safe. Um, he could get his, his glory from there. And, and, if, and think about this. If God needs all this evil and suffering in the world, um, then the cross wasn't enough. Uh, God, the cross would have been a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. condition. Um, on this needy view, uh, you need what Jesus did on the cross, plus the majority of humanity damned to hell for eternity in order to save the elect and to let God get the glory that he desires. Um, yeah, I, I explained this in my book. Not a good explanation. You know, Tim, I don't um, know if you're aware of this, but uh, earlier this year or last year, I, it was last year, I guess, I read uh, Graham Oppie's Arguing About Gods. And uh, he's probably one of the he's probably the most formidable atheist voice in the world today, whether he's yeah. the most popular or not. And, um, you know, he, he was talking in his book about the problem of free will in heaven. You know, we talk about that a lot. How can you have free will in heaven and there not be evil and all those kind of things? Yeah. And in that section, which wasn't a huge section, I think it was kind of like a, I, I don't know if it was an appendix, but it felt like that. Uh, but he actually says that the that the one thing the the one theological explanation this is not his exact quote this is me remembering from last year but i made a video about it uh the the one explanation that makes sense of why evil here and no evil in heaven and yet libertarian freedom here and in heaven is if the molinists are correct and there is there was actually one world to actualize where you get a perfect heaven but that particular world also was a world where you had the particular evils you have here on earth. And so you get the character building aspect of evil that prepares you in some sense along the path of sanctification for heaven. But at the same time, it, it's, just, it's not as though something changes in your metaphysical makeup in heaven. It's just that uh, no, God actualized a world and there may, and maybe this was the only one or there's only a few or something, you know, where, where, um, where it works out like that and you actually get a perfect, I thought it was interesting. Now he discounts Molinism for other reasons in another chapter, but I thought that was a pretty interesting thing for you to know, since you talk about these things coming from Graham Oppie. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that. I haven't read, uh, that work. And, uh, I gotta say, um, kind of takes, uh, you know, this kind of steals my thunder a little bit because I've got uh, I've got a forthcoming. I finished this thing two years ago uh, yeah. and it's finally being published in early 2023. It's another cool journal article I co-authored with. And you make that point. Erasmus. I do make that point. Yeah. Um, and in fact, go on to say how we can solve all the problems of evil, uh, basically with the. Well, at the that, very least, at, at the very least, Tim, you can you can add a name to the citation list. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll have to do that. So. <laughs> All right. So let's get you back on track here. I'm sorry that I sidetracked you with that. Uh, so let's let's get back into it. Here we go. Of disagreement between the two views is that I, I'm going to take the Calvinist view to be deterministic. That's affirming theological determinism. Uh, in other words, that God determines the outcome of human free choices. So human beings make choices, we are morally responsible, but the Calvinist says those are determined by God. And even though they are determined, it doesn't mean that they are not morally responsible or free. So the, the Calvinist view is a compatibilist view. That's the compatibility between uh, free will and moral responsibility on the one side and determinism on the other. And so the Calvinist affirms that, and the Molinist, uh, among the sets of affirmations that they make, is one of incompatibilism. So the, the view of free will that is incompatible with uh, determinism, uh, sometimes called libertarianism, right? So that's the, the view that free will is incompatible with determinism, and also that we sometimes have free will. Um, and so that disagreement uh, places Calvinists and Molinists on the, the two sides of the compatibility debate. Is it compatible with determinism? And 
also they are both affirming like one is affirming determinism and the other one is denying it so first of all tim i just got to tell you when i was listening to this debate i thought i wish i could say libertarian like he does because it sounds so cool the way he says libertarian uh you need to be yeah. a libertarian y'all just so just because you get to say it more go ahead uh and yeah. interact with this material for us tim yeah well he gave a definition of libertarianism and i really don't like that definition <laughs> yeah i'm not even gonna try um <laughs> No, I, I don't like that definition, and I'm glad that Kirk provided his own definition in the debate. He he didn't, you know, uh, it's been said before that there's no official definitions in philosophy. So explain what you mean by that, and then if you don't agree with the definition, you can say, well, this is what I mean by that. And and I'm glad that Kirk provided his own definition in the debate. Now, I got to say, I did use the definition Guillaume offered in the first edition of my book. But I'm not going to use it in the second edition. And this is because there are some kinds of free will that are compatible with determinism. And I recognize that. But I don't think they're the kinds of freedom that we really care about. So, for example, I've written about this before, but it could be the case that I am completely determined, but I am also free to order tacos for dinner tonight. Uh, if I want tacos for dinner tonight. Right. But big deal. But when we apply the freedom to order tacos at dinner to moral issues, uh, one could be completely determined by God, uh, but, but say that the Calvinist is free to commit adultery if he wants to commit adultery, and nothing stops him from committing adultery. So this kind of freedom isn't that great, especially when one comprehends the bigger picture that, Ed, that the Ed Calvinist has in mind, that God determines all things about the human, which includes your greatest wants and desires at a specific moment. So, and then if you always choose according to your greatest desire at a specific moment, and God doesn't causally determine you or prevent you from doing that, then you are determined to do it by God, right? Yeah, because so, like what you're trying to drive at is intention. You still have the intention. As long as the agent has the intention, intends to do evil, then he's culpable. But what you're pointing out is, well, yeah, but everything that led to that intention being realized in the person was also determined, you know, yeah, so, God determined yeah. the intention and right? Guillaume doesn't None deny that. Right? What's that? Guillaume doesn't deny this. No, he can't because he affirms exhaustive divine determinism. He might not use that label, but that's his position. So yeah, if one always acts on their wants and greatest desires, if nothing stops them, then they say that the Calvinist was free to commit adultery here, even though he was causally determined by God to cheat on his wife. So I think it's better to talk about libertarian freedom and then discuss the vital difference between libertarian freedom and determinism. So let's, let's do that. And I said it before, I'll say it again. An event is determined if antecedent conditions are sufficient to necessitate the event. And since the event is necessitated, by prior states, uh, this idea is often referred to as causal determinism. But sometimes I know Guillaume doesn't want to use the word causal. Fine, I'll just talk about determinism if that's the case. Now, a person's uh, thought, action, or choice is free in the libertarian sense if it's not random and antecedent conditions are insufficient, right? They're not sufficient to necessitate the thought, action, or choice. So, for example, um, if a Calvinist commits adultery, if that is true, then the Calvinist was determined by antecedent conditions, even prior to the person's existence, prior to the Calvinist's existence. He couldn't have done otherwise. Then, then, yeah, it necessitated the event, right? The adultery happened to him, but he did not actively choose to do this evil. None of it is up to him as the source if exhaustive divine determinism is true. Now, I think most people when they grasp this idea, we'll see that the poor Calvinist who cheated on his wife could not help it. And he was a victim of the conditions, right? Intentionally created and fine tuned by God that preceded his birth. So what say you, Braxton? No, I, I yeah. I mean, you're just enunciating what I've preached for years, man. I'm with you on that. I have nothing yeah. meaningful to add beyond what you just said. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, let's go to the next clip. <laughs> Well, I mean, except just to say that, like, I, I think, I mean, 
what we're we're interested in truth, but the, the practical outflow of yeah. this can be horrific because you, you can you can because like the man who commits adultery you're talking about, he consciously experienced him doing what he couldn't have done otherwise. You know, he had to do this and not I mean, he experienced it as a choice. But if Calvinism is true and determinism is true, he, he's just a, a passenger experiencing all of these things. That's not how they view it. But I'm saying that's how it really looks when you in, in, plug into determinism. Well, if I take that to be the case, I was thinking of this as I was walking this morning, listening to this debate on my morning walk. And I'm, I'm walking along and I'm thinking, OK, well, let me consider because in my morning walk, I usually consider the day before and, and I pray at the end of my morning walk. So I, I think about um, sinful stuff I've done or or what's my thought life like and all those kind of things. Well, invariably, if you're an honest person and honest with yourself and with God, you're going to find things within yourself that that are not right. And maybe there are longstanding things that you're still in the process of working on. And the, so those things were already on my mind. So they immediately came to mind. And I thought, if I thought this, if I thought this, it would be so easy for me to just I mean, not easy. I would feel required to think whatever I end up doing is what God determined I would do. Yeah. And my choices are all determined. My thoughts are all determined. My beliefs are all determined. Um, so I, I'll tell you, I think it would serve as at least some sort of a reaction in my depravity to the conviction of the Holy Spirit that otherwise might work on me to the point of repentance about things. Right. Um, I, I, I know how that sounds to Calvinists. I'm giving you biographical information about me. And I've heard a lot of other people say this. Uh, if it's not true about you, praise the Lord. And ultimately, it does matter what's true. But these are some of my reactions. <laughs> yeah. And I, it kind of seems to me like uh, it can be used as a get out of jail free card. Mm -hmm. um, because they're like, well, I, I, you know, if somebody believed that, uh, and I used to be that guy, right? Uh, I could justify. I used to be a Calvinist and an exhaustive divine determinist. And so if I did something that was wrong, objectively wrong, I could be like, well, um, God determined me to do it. Yeah. Was it what I wanted to do? Yep. But God determines my wants and I can't do otherwise. Um, and it, you know, I've written on this on my website too. It's, it's just, uh, it's a dangerous view, I think. And All right. So here we are. He says, Molinism, what Guillaume? Itself doesn't tell us just strongly, just how strongly the Molinist story of uh, evil and the Calvinist story of evil are going to, to differ. What's going to matter is any specific Molinist, how much they are going to be using libertarian free will as a response to the problem of evil to say those instances of evil only happened because we have libertarian free will and God tried to um, bring things differently, right? To bring about things differently. But because those counterfactuals limit his options, this is an evil that happens that's purely explained by libertarian free will. No other greater purpose than this, just libertarian free will. So the more a Molinist does that, the more he disagrees with the Calvinist, but he doesn't have to do that a whole lot. Right? He could say that plenty, like almost all of the evil that happens, God has simple greater goods that he's looking after. And this is exactly what he wants to bring about for the sake of those greater goods, exactly like the Calvinist says. You know, I'll just reiterate what I've already made clear. The Molinist doesn't say that it's just about free will, period. Right? We say that it's about the best kind of love and important kinds of rationality worth wanting. Um, and then we make the case as to why these things both require humans to possess libertarian freedom. So it's not just about libertarian freedom for the sake of libertarian freedom. Libertarian freedom makes these greater goods possible. And on top of all of that, as I showed in my evil argument against all the problems of evil that I offered earlier in this video, um, you know, it's, it's all the problems of evil. It's not just moral evil here. Right. God's middle knowledge is also a key aspect in solving these problems that face all, you know, that face all the views that deny this aspect of God's knowledge. So I, I respectfully disagree with my brother Guillaume here and, and that it's not just about libertarian freedom. It's about libertarian freedom and what God knows prior to his libertarian free choice to create this specific world. So. All right, let's look at another clip here, Tim. 
So I think it's going to be helpful to see a little bit uh, just where on the spectrum of Molinists uh, Kirk falls, because I've heard him say some pretty robust things of, in favor of God's providence in the past. And yeah, <laughs> I think I've mentioned to him that some of the things he says make me think that he's the kind of Molinist that I would be if I had to give up my Calvinism. That is that he's making some pretty strong uh, statements about predestination and election. Um, I think that in his book, he's, ex he's explaining that Molina rejects Arminius's exegesis of Romans 9. Uh, he's saying that election is not uh, based on, it's not a corporate election. Uh, it's not based on foreseen faith. Uh, that uh, it's purely the electing grace of God uh, and that uh, Molina says that any saved person in this world could have been lost and any lost could have been saved in alternate worlds and it's all in God's providence that one happens and not the other. So those kinds of very robust statements about providence and uh, election uh, are extremely close and you know, they almost melt my Calvinist heart, um, but uh, <laughs> we'll see just how... Uh, how much of a use of libertarian free will uh, Kirk makes in this conversation about evil, for all I know, he could be telling a very similar story as the Calvinist one here. And I, I'd say that, you know, uh, Guillaume is mentioning how close these two views are, but there's some really big differences. Um, and, you know, I guess the first thing, what you know, I've heard him say on multiple occasions that if Calvinism were proven false, that his next favorite view is Molinism. So I'm taking uh, that to mean that he would be a Molinist if Calvinism, um, if he was convinced that Calvinism is false. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that he does become a Molinist. Uh, but, but here's the, some of the differences. I mean, most Molinists that I talk to, and definitely not all, but a whole lot of them anyway, including me, if, I, if it was demonstrated to me that Molinism was false. I definitely wouldn't be an exhaustive divine determinist. Um, and I'd probably be an open theist. Uh, mm. And I would hate to do that because I think that's a, a, a low view of God as well. But I think it's better than the Calvinist view, especially mm. the one that attaches itself to exhaustive divine determinism. Um, so, yeah, I do think Molinism is the best explanation here. But, yes, I do want to agree. Well, and, and with... before you go before you go on, Tim, I was going to say, I remember in the debate, we didn't play the clip here, but he sets up the four primary options that you have, yeah. which is you have Arminian, you have like open theism, a simple foreknowledge view, Molinism and Calvinism. And he says on that mm -hmm. spread, I've put those in the order of, how how much alike they are or the progression and he says so molinism is right next door to calvinism well maybe in that listing of four and so i get that and i like that he thinks that it touches on enough of the things that he's interested in or, or that he thinks are true that if calvinism fell he'd go there but the the distance between calvinism and molinism is as vast as the difference between libertarian freedom and determinism, because those other three views affirm libertarian freedom. The people usually affirm, mm -hmm. affirm libertarian freedom. That puts all three of those other views in an, a, a, a completely different category as yeah. Calvinism. Yeah. So uh, it may be the closest to Calvinism, but depending on what one is thinking about related to these things at a particular point, it is still a long way from Calvinism because that key issue, and it's what matters here in this this issue that we're discussing right now that he's talking about, is that however much alike we are, the libertarian freedom is the primary thing, and he even says that. He's like, so that's why we got to find out how much that's a part of this. Yeah, and that's well said, Braxton. Um, there's a, a, a huge uh, separation between the two views. But Calvinists and Molinists are very similar. We do share um, some important uh, beliefs. Uh, in fact, as many probably know, and you know, I've, I've said this already on this video, I believe, I used to hold to Beyond's exact view, and I was quite aggressive about it. Um, I not only held to all five points of Calvinism, but I affirmed exhaustive divine determinism, that God determined all things all the time, including every twist and turn of all of my thoughts and my evaluations and, and my deliberations and, and everything like that, all my judgments, that God determined them. Now, I was a pastor during that time, and I would preach it from the pulpit. I would preach determinism and five-point Calvinism from the pulpit, and I would fight anyone who disagreed, including my wife. In fact, I, I wrote a, 
uh, an article on my website called Molinism Saves Marriages. Um, I encourage people to uh, go see that. But once I grasped, uh, grasped the doctrine of middle knowledge, I realized uh, that God could predestine all things without determining all things. And that melted my Calvinist heart. <laughs> and, I, and then I was transformed into a Molinist. So I'm, I'm hoping and, and praying that uh, Guillaume's heart, his Calvinist heart, uh, melts yeah. into a Molinist heart soon. But We're going to melt you know. it. We're going to melt it, Guillaume. We're coming for you. The free, the, uh, what do you call him? The free, what did you call Dan Chap? Freedom fighter. The freedom fighters freedom are coming fighter. for you, Guillaume. The libertarian, libertarian freedom fighters. The liber so libertarian <laughs> freedom fighters <laughs> okay all right um we're, we're, you know us libertarian uh freedom uh fighters are, are always fighting for the french um hey we'll take the french the man we'll yeah, take yeah, the french we love the french so, yeah <laughs> and we're not we don't want to fight the french we want to fight for them uh, anyway i would say this transformation of mine where, where my calvinist heart was melted into a molinist heart that was either up to me and, uh, and I was not causally determined on that journey or God determined me, uh, you know, God determined me to have the truth about, think about how awkward and absurd this would be, that God determined me to have the truth about determinism and preach it from the pulpit for all those years. And then, even though I was preaching truth, decided to determine me to hold false theological beliefs. Now, I'll tell you, if you're going to make that move, that's going to get us into all kinds of problems when it comes to epistemic evil, which is, I think, the biggest problem of evil that the Calvinist faces. And, and that's going to open a huge can of worms for the Calvinist. But uh, we, we will talk about that later. Um, J.P. Moreland and I talk a lot about that in our paper. I'm so, so glad you're writing that paper with Moreland. Yeah. I'm so glad. That's going to be so powerful. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. Well, thank you. And, and thanks for taking a look at it before we yeah. submitted it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, even thanked you at, at the end. Um, I appreciate you it. You and man. Pritchett that for taking a melts look at it. my but, uh, heart. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so here's the bottom line. Uh, both Calvinists and Molinists, here's what we affirm. We both affirm exhaustive predestination. Uh, what we disagree with is the mechanism, as it were in which God brings it about. Now, one mechanism rejects libertarian freedom and the other mechanism affirms it. Thus, I argue that the, the Calvinist mechanism rejects the best kind of love and important kinds of rationality and the Molinist mechanism gets to keep the best kind of love and important kinds of rationality, not to mention desert responsibility. So we both affirm predestination. We just argue over how God predestines all things and mm -hmm. so in one sense, it's really kind of a silly disagreement, right? We're both affirming exhaustive predestination. Now, I have seen some Calvinists uh, back away from that, actually, when it comes to double predestination. As a Molinist, I say, well, God can't help it if he's omnipotent and omniscient, and he creates everything is predestined, right? But uh, so it's kind of a silly disagreement, but in another sense, it might be the most important of all the secondary issues of theology. Since we're talking about love, the use of reason, and desert responsibility, all of which are discussed or implied in Scripture, so I think it's pretty important. But anyway, I think yeah, I, man, we should probably move to McGregor's opening speech and talk about that a little bit. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Goodbye, Bignon, and hello, McGregor. All right, here we go with McGregor. Is he is he Scotch? Is he Scottish? McGregor. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Let me begin by noting an intuition that many atheists and theists share. An all-good God would not determine other persons to commit evil. I realize that Dr. Bignon does not share this intuition. And I don't want to just leave things at the realm of intuition, although I do believe that's a very powerful intuition for most okay, people. Heck yeah, it is. Um, but I think a good argument can be made in favor of it. And yeah. I give this That's argument good. so as hopefully not to be accused of um, question begging. So the argument would run as follows. Premise one, let's, let's stop it for God a has implanted his moral law in the soul of every human. 
Yeah. Yeah. Before he goes to the argument, um, I'd like to point out a couple things here. Uh, yeah. A strong case can be made uh, that the objective purpose of life, you know, the mark we ought to hit is love. So God's nature is love, according to 1 John 4, 8. Uh, Jesus made it clear, um, basically what the purpose of life is to love God and love others. You know, love God first and everybody love everybody from your neighbors to those who would consider yourself you to be an enemy love them as you love yourself right the, the purpose of life is all about love and if you get those the greatest commands right everything else seems to fall into place and that's because god's nature is love so we were created on purpose and for the specific purpose to hit the mark of love and to do otherwise to miss the mark and do evil and that's easy to remember because love spelled backwards is evil um i'm not, I, not the best speller but you're never gonna forget <laughs> it. um so uh, anyway, um, if God's nature is love, it seems ridiculous to think that God would causally determine Satan to think, want, and act in evil manners, not to mention all the evil committed by humans from the evil of Hitler to the Calvinist who acts on his lusts to the Arminian who robs the bank, right? <laughs> um, right? According to the Calvinist, God determined the Calvinist to have the lust and act on lust and and he could not do otherwise. So that is to say, via God's decree or based upon the <clears throat> conditions he created, these antecedent conditions were sufficient to necessitate each and every specific act of evil in the world. They were fine-tuned by God to do this, which seems to contradict God's essential nature of love. Now, Kirk's going to provide an argument with this idea in mind in the next clip. But I'll just note that this is why so many people share the intuition that God would not determine evil by way of cause and effect. However, as I've already argued today, although God would not determine evil, a perfectly loving God would allow libertarian agents to commit and experience evil for the sake of love and eternal love. And on top of that, let me say it again, in the forthcoming paper with J.P. Moreland, we argue that Ed Calvinists cannot trust their intuitions. And we show that the Molinist, however, has good reason to pay attention to our intuitions. But I'm not gonna oh, jump into those waters today. Yeah, I'll, de I'll defend that uh, with you in a future episode. Cool, all right, let's get back to Kirk. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Two, according to that moral law, it is evil to determine another person to commit evil. Three. God's moral law flows necessarily from, and thus accurately represents, God's nature. Four, God at least would not, and perhaps could not, do evil. Five, God at least would not, and perhaps could not, act contrary to God's nature. Six, therefore God would not, and perhaps could not, determine another person to commit evil. I'll assume, for the sake of conversation, that the intuition is correct. I'm sure Guillaume will have something to say about that, and that this argument is sound. So now we face the question, can Molinism offer us a solution to the problem of evil according to which God does not determine other persons to commit evil? To up the ante, can Molinism offer us a solution to the problem of evil according to which God does not determine evil, period. At this point, I will briefly review the basics of Molinism. Molinism holds... Okay, did you want to say anything about any of that, Tim, before we let him go over Molinism here? Um, yeah, I've already provided it today. Fast forward uh, a while and go to 39.16, and we'll save okay. some time. And uh, he's going to talk about, at this point, the non-Molinist could object... The universe is a metaphysically necessary being. Not only is this false, but it would also violate God's aseity. So God, at least, has libertarian freedom at the lowest level of specificity, choosing between equally good options, thus showing that the concept of libertarian freedom is logically possible. Hence, I don't see that there's anything preventing an omnipotent God from creating persons with libertarian freedom. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I just want to say, well said, Kirk. <laughs> now, Kirk 
said that he was not sure what view Guillaume held, but as you and I discussed earlier, I've heard him make uh, comments, I've heard Guillaume make comments in the past that he's not sure if God has libertarian freedom, and he seems to think that it's not that big of a deal if God doesn't have alternative possibilities at his disposal. Now, to be clear, I, I do not believe Bignon says that God does not have libertarian freedom, but he seems to be open to the idea that God can only do one thing. Um, and that instead of being omnipotent, he is unipotent. <laughs> um, and that and, and that one thing is to create and de determine the actual world and all that actually happens in it. That's the only thing he could do. Again, I, uh, Guillaume's not going to say that that is true, but he seems to be open to that being true. Now, if that's the case, then God could not have refrained from creation or created any differently. Um, Guillaume has called this the boogeyman uh, when Christians are repulsed by the idea that God does not possess alternative possibilities. But I, I think the major problem with this boogeyman is that it downgrades God from being omnipotent to, like I said, only being unipotent. You know, Unipotent. Can God do all? Yeah, yeah. He's omnipotent, right? Um, can God do all things or can God only do one thing? Now, if God is the omnipotent, then by definition, it seems that God possesses alternative uh, possibilities and thus possesses libertarian freedom. So as I argued in my book, if God has libertarian freedom, then the concept of libertarian freedom is logically, logically coherent. And if an omnipotent God can do all things logically possible, then it seems that God can create humans in his image and likeness and thus create humanity with an ability to be a first mover and a first thinker, uh, which is a weak form of libertarian freedom, and with the power to choose between alternative possibilities in the real and actual world, which is a strong form of libertarian freedom. So, yeah, that's what do you think? At the very least, what I love about that, Tim, is if you have a Calvinist and and you can't, it's it's you can't tell Calvinists really do differ a lot on this. But if you've yeah. got a Calvinist who's willing to say God maybe has libertarian free will or God does have libertarian freedom, then in such a case, one thing that is completely off the table, as you and McGregor have pointed out here, is the notion that there is, in principle, an impossibility about libertarian freedom. Even if we can't point to what it is, it's just it seems impossible or it seems like uh, you know when you run the intelligibility problem and things like that, it just seems like if they think it doesn't work, well, if it works for God, or if even you think it might work for God, if it's epistemically mm -hmm. possible for you that it works for God, well, then in, you can't say in principle it's an impossibility or it doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so. All right. So let's go on to the next clip. Molinism also affords Christians a very helpful hermeneutic for understanding passages ascribing evil to God. Now, several passages of Scripture indicate that God cannot do evil. But other passages of scripture indicate that God sent evil spirits to people, brought evil on persons or nations, killed, hardened Pharaoh's heart, and will send a powerful delusion to evildoers in the end times. I take it for granted that scripture does not contradict itself. Accordingly, it follows that there must be more than one way for God to do or cause something. But scripture does not explain these ways. Loving God with all our minds, it seems to me, impels us to use philosophy as theology's handmaiden and ask, are there different senses of doing or causing that can make sense of the biblical data? All right, here we are again, Tim. Uh, break this down for us. I just want to say uh, he's made a great point. A maximally great being has more than determinism at his disposal, right? God can determine everything. Uh, he's got the power to do so. Um, but God can also predestine all things without determining all things. And that's what I spend so much, so much of my time discussing. Yeah. All right. Let's keep trucking. All right. Thus, I believe that Molinism affords a solution to the problem of evil, according to which God determines no evil and brings about the best feasible world, or a feasible world tied for the best, I should say. To atheists and theists alike who share the intuition that it is evil to determine another person to commit evil, and perhaps the further intuition, which I have not defended, that it is evil to determine evil, 
Molinism provides, in my judgment, the most attractive solution to the problem of evil. And then yeah, I've always that. loved this, Tim, what we just saw, because I, I think it really does bring out one of the beautiful things that we that every Christian, you know, well, <laughs> most Christians believe about God. Everything good that happens in the world on Molinism is because of and only really because of God. Everything that's bad or pain or suffering or evil that is not because of God. That's because of agents. Yeah, and we're going to discuss this and our intuitions more when we get to their conversation and the uh, cross-examination or, or in their discussion when they talk about uh, Bullet Bill. So I'll, I'll table that for the moment, and we'll talk about it more soon. All right, sounds good. Let's keep trucking. It seems obvious that the best possible world is one where God determines that no one ever sin, all receive God's grace, all receive salvation, no evil at all occurs. But it is obvious that this is not that world. God can create that world, and God doesn't. In that case, it seems the greater good defense or the morally sufficient reason defense doesn't work, as God doesn't need evil to bring about that world. So it seems to me that the greater good defense is only available to the non-Calvinist. And so I'm wondering, Guillaume, where do you think the error in my argument is? Yeah, the error is in supposing that uh, because you don't see those possible good reasons, therefore the, the uh, response is not available, right? The response is exactly along those lines to say there are morally sufficient reasons, there are greater goods that God is after. Um, and just because we don't know those reasons doesn't mean they're not there. The intuition that you're trying to share is to say, I can't possibly think of anything that would be better for God than to save everybody or to avoid every single sin in the world. So what you're saying is you're sharing your ignorance of what good reasons there might be, which is the exact move that the atheist is doing with the problem of evil, saying there could not, I, I cannot imagine what God would be uh, thinking in allowing all this evil in the world. Therefore, it's not justified and therefore God is not there. So once again, I found myself in the same position as I am in responding to the atheist, simply saying, yes, I, I hear your inability to see those morally good reasons, but just because we don't see them or you don't see them doesn't mean that they're not there and that God could be having morally sufficient reasons by those greater goods, even if I can't spell out every in every single instance what those greater goods are. Yeah, you know, I, you know this goes there. back, Tim. What we just saw goes back to something we already discussed a little while ago, um, and that is this this notion that we can use Calvinists can use the greater good argument, um, and this is where McGregor presses this. Uh, and and so I, I look at this and I think, well, I mean, you're going to unpack it, but I look at this and I think, what well, the difference is. When, when we say to an atheist who brings an argument from evil, and, and if um, someone brings like a skeptical theist type answer and says, I don't know why God allowed that particular instance of evil, but, um, but there, there could be some explanation and you know, that sort of thing. Like, like uh, maybe we're not in a position to expect to see the sorts of goods that might come out of that, right? Um, yeah. I, I'm not in a position when I look in the backyard if you say, well, there are no worms in the backyard. Well, how do you know? I looked at the backyard. I didn't see any. We wouldn't expect you to be able to see worms like that if they're in the backyard. Yeah. And maybe that's how it is with evil. When we say that, we're still operating, you and I, when we're talking to the atheist from a perspective of libertarian freedom. But when you take yeah. away libertarian freedom, it's not that we're just not aware of all the scenarios that might play out. It's a principled problem with the notion that the very, the very means by which we're arguing you can even have morally sufficient actions has now been removed. So in principle, yeah. you can't even have greater goods unless you want to say something like the greater good is God's determinism of all things, that that good uh, sort of makes it worth it, all the suffering. But that I've never even heard anyone argue that. So, yeah, that'd be an odd view. Um, I think the problem for the Calvinist is twofold here. Uh, first, the Molinist can offer specific reasons, as I said before, explaining exactly why God would allow all the pain, evil, and suffering and all the affliction in the world. And the Calvinist just says, well, God might have good reasons to determine all the evil in the world, but no one knows what they are. Okay, well, philosophically minded theologians ought to go with the best explanation of all the data. 
if one if one view can explain all the biblical data and affirm God's maximal greatness and also explain exactly why God allows all the pain, evil, and suffering and affliction in the world, and the other view punts to mystery and winds up rejecting one of God's essential attributes or more, then it seems to me that a rational person will choose to go with the view that provides the best explanation of all the data. Uh, thus, it's quite reasonable to be a Molinist. Uh, now, second, um, if God determines all things, God can simply determine perfection from the beginning. I already said that, I'll, but it's important to hammer that home. So there does not seem to be any greater goods that come along for the ride of God determining evil in the world. Now, on the libertarian view, the greater good of evil is the end game. God has eschatology in mind. But on a deterministic view, God could determine the end game from the very beginning. A maximally great being does not need evil if he is going to determine all things via cause and effect, via antecedent conditions necessitating all things. According to God's moral law, and by God's moral law, I don't mean the Torah. I don't mean the 613 mitzvot. I'm talking about the moral law that Paul describes in Romans 2, 14 to 15. And it seems to me that um, that moral law, um, according to it, that the type of world that an all good God would choose if determinism is inescapable for God if he's going to create every anything, is to create a world of universal salvation, of no evil, and so forth. And I would say that God's moral law flows necessarily from and thus accurately represents God's nature. And so it seems to me that in order for you to avoid this, you have to adopt divine voluntarism. You have to say, no, 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 God's moral law doesn't flow necessarily from. It doesn't accurately represent God's nature. Um, it may be his, um, his preceptive will, but that doesn't really represent God's nature. And in that case, I don't know how you get around um, the Euthyphro dilemma. So I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I need to fight off the Euthyphro dilemma here. I'm not in the, in the situation of trying to place the moral argument for God's existence. All right. So I think the moral argument is quite relevant to this discussion um, on, you know, what view handles the problem of evil better. I mean, that's the moral argument. It's talking about uh, evil and how we ought to live. In fact, I, I discuss this at length in my book. Now, uh, let me share what Dr. David Baggett, who many consider to be the world's leading authority on all things related to the moral argument, has said about this. He's a, a philosophy professor at Houston uh, Baptist University. Actually, it's now Houston Christian University as of uh, just a few days ago. They changed the name. But Baggett has said this, quote, among the moral phenomena in need of rich explanation is moral freedom, without which it would seem we cannot rightly be held deeply responsible for our actions, either accolades for doing well or blameworthiness for shirking our duties. Speaking as an advocate of the moral arguments for God, I applaud my friend Tim Stratton's clear-headed and rigorous defense of the sort of robust libertarian freedom without which morality and many of its salient categories lose much of their distinctive import, prescriptive clout, and binding authority, end quote. So, I mean, yeah, I do think that uh, the, the Euthyphro dilemma here that Kirk posed to Guillaume, I think Guillaume just tried to dismiss it, say, hey, I don't need to do that here. We're not talking about the moral argument. But the moral argument is highly relevant. It's, it's related to this topic. So I would have loved to have uh, heard Guillaume. Uh, yeah. In my, in my, in my debate with, um, with Joe Myra uh, several years ago, um, where he just threw back his hands and said, free will is an illusion. Um, I, uh, I was, I, I made this point, which I'm in my opening statements, I brought out that the, the thing is we have to have a response to arguments from evil and I and 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 so when you're question when you're asking questions about the Euthyphro dilemma and what's the nature of God and Guillaume knows all this Guillaume's like you said he's an incredible thinker 
And um, so I don't think I'm saying anything he doesn't know. I just like to know what he says about this yeah. because if you because this is vital. Th this has to do with the justice. This has to do with the fairness or the morality or the, uh, the all of these issues are very important. And yes, the moral argument is typically an argument for God's existence. But really, what I took Kirk to be doing was just pulling something that often is an objection and pulling it out of that and and saying, look, I really think that, that this one actually hits you un until you answer it. But I think Guillaume probably has a response. Maybe he just didn't want to get into it. I'd like to know what that response is. I don't know that he's telling us that it's, it's wrong for us to determine someone else to do evil. Like determining is a very philosophical term. I don't know that it's found anywhere. And if you try to phrase it in ways that are a bit sh falling short of determinism, right, to make someone else do something or to bring about that somebody else does that, then you're back to denying what you say God does even on Molinism, right? Because as long as you fall short of talking about determinism, your Molinist view will commit you to saying that God does all of those things about evil, right? He does bring about evil. He does de he does foreordain that evil happen. He makes people do evil. Now, he makes them freely do evil, right, uh, on libertarian view, but he makes all of that. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I just, uh, you know, Guillaume uh, used the word makes, when he, you know, talking about he, that God makes people do evil on the Molinist view. And I say, no. Uh, God predestines evil in the world without making anyone do evil, at least in the way that most people would use the word uh, make or making, right? Again, here's the difference. On Ed Calvinism, God creates antecedent conditions which are sufficient to necessitate the evil uh, that passed through Satan. A third of all the angels, Adam and Eve, Hitler and the, the Calvinist who committed adultery, right? God created those antecedent conditions, which uh, most people would say that that forced that to happen or that made that happen. Right. These things necessitated all of these antecedent conditions necessitated all of this evil. And God finally tuned, uh, as it were, the antecedent conditions to make sure um, that it was necessitated. Now, on Molinism, God created antecedent conditions which are not sufficient to necessitate the evil of Satan, a third of all the angels, Adam and Eve, Hitler, uh, or the Calvinist who commits adultery, right? Uh, now, of course, prior to creation, an omniscient God knows how free creatures would freely choose, but this is not determinism, it's predestination. So yeah. again, we, we agree on the predestination, but we're showing um, the, the, the big differences here. That I think most people are going to uh, have the intuition that it's wrong to, uh, to uh, to necessitate, right? The, the Ed Calvinist view, God necessitates evil. The Molinist view, God allows evil. And The reason uh, it's important, I think, to say it the way you're saying it, Tim, instead of just saying God made it that way or whatever, yeah. but to say, look, what we're talking about is that those antecedent conditions were insufficient uh, or on the Calvinist view that they were sufficient to bring about the necessity of the event. And um, the reason it's important to say it that way, partly, we've already talked about one of the features of that, but another one is because those antecedent conditions, they're not necessary, but they are necessary to do something else, and that is to, to uh, result in influences. We do have influences, and there's no mm -hmm. problem granting that when I see a box of pizza at my house, I'm, I'm influenced something fierce, but, uh, but, but I still have, but when I walk away from the pizza or eat the pizza is still ultimately, I, I was able to make a libertarian choice in the face of those influences. Hmm. You took your temptations captive. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All of that language of God's providentially bringing about evil is true on Molinism and will find itself refuted as, as long as you don't speak directly of determinism on the Calvinist view to criticize it. But if you do speak of determinism purely, then it's question begging because, yeah, you're saying it's wrong to determine evil. Okay, well, I disagree with that. So now where do we go from here? If you, if you readjust by giving me something a bit milder than determinism, you refute Molinism in the process. No. We are not saying that it's wrong for God to determine evil or that God is inappropriately involved in evil. Rather, what Kirk has pointed out is that God making evil happen by way of deterministic cause and effect seems to contradict 
God's essential nature, namely that God is love, 1 John 4, 8, right? So we're, we're talking about God's nature, not that it's wrong or anything like this. It's, it's violating God's, uh, one of God's omni attributes. So it, it's really, it's amazing to me to see the lack of Calvinistic work on love. You know, they often discuss all of God's other attributes, but God's perfect love is often neglected. And when notable Calvinist, uh, you know, A.W. A. Pink did discuss uh, God's love, he then denied omnibenevolence, saying that God does not love all people. Well, as A.W. Tozer would say, that's a low view of God. And and let me add that we do not, uh, we, we don't defeat Molinism in the process by doing this. On Calvinism, there is an unbroken causal chain created by God that determines evil. On Molinism, there's a break in that causal chain, and humans are first movers then who can freely choose evil. And I think that's a big and important difference. Now, and uh, the second point I wanted to make about this uh, distinction about what God commands us to do and what he's seemingly bound by his nature not to do is that there's plenty of things that we know are exactly like that, where the distinction between the creator and the creatures is such that there are things that are wrong for us to do but that God has perfectly the prerogative of doing so without being morally tainted, right? Taking somebody else's life is one notorious example. God is free to take my life this very moment if he pleases. He's the author and creator of my life. Uh, is the author and creator of the world and sustainer of it. Uh, if it pleases him to simply seize my life right now by stopping my heartbeat, there's nothing wrong with that right? in God's purposes. Uh, but if I were to go and stop your heartbeat, I think that would be morally wrong indeed. So there's plenty of things that are different in terms of obligations for us as human beings than they are for God. And I don't see that determining somebody else to do evil couldn't be one of those things where there's a distinction, an asymmetry between what's okay for God to do and what's not okay for me to do. Okay, so I kind of agree with what uh, Guillaume says about it's. I mean, within my perspective, for hey, if God wants to stop my heart, that's that's His business. He's God. If uh, I want to stop your heart, that's not within my purview as your employer. Um, have I got that right? <laughs> yeah, I hope you don't stop stop my heart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have those powers anyway. <laughs> oh, good, good. Not without a lot of money and strategy. <laughs> well. Um, yeah, I want to uh, kind of agree with Guillaume here, but again, I think this fails to take God's nature of love into account. So sure, God is free to, end, he's got the power to end an innocent person's life for no good reason, uh, you know, apart from natural processes, right? How, however, I, I don't think God does this kind of thing unless it's an act of judgment, which is a good reason. And humans have that right also. To, you know, to stop people's hearts for good reason. Mm. You know, uh, in fact, I have a video on my YouTube channel that I just did called Love Thy Neighbor and Pack Thy Heat, where I talk about this. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> That's good. But, uh, my point is that Calvinism seems to violate God's nature as a whole. And Molinism, on the other hand, as I've argued in my book at length, does not violate God's nature or the fact that God is a maximally great being. And so I, I say you can't violate each of his or any of his attributes. And so any view that winds up violating an attribute, you got to get it out of here or find a way to explain it. And, uh, and I think Molinism is the only way to do that. Um, yeah. Now, this next part um, between uh, the two debaters is one of my favorite exchanges of the debate. So let's take a look at that one. Let's roll into that now. But it seems still in that case that the moral law that God has given us, that there, it doesn't flow necessarily from God's nature. That's, I guess that's what I'm concerned about. And in the book, um, you, you're you able to show differences between like people on divine determinism and pets, puppets, coerced people, manipulated people, and mentally ill people. I'm not sure those are the relevant differences, but I'll leave that aside for now. However, one point I'll concede to you is that none of those are actual cases of determination. So I wondered, do I really know, or do I really you know, have this, do we have this strong sense that it's wrong 
to determine someone else to commit evil? Is that part of the moral law that God has written on our hearts? And so I thought, how would you handle an actual case of determination? And of course, my mind goes to demon possession. Mark 5 tells the story of the Gerasene demoniac. And interestingly, it describes what the demon does as what the man does. So we could say on your view, you know, the man is really responsible for the evil that he's, he carries out while he's um, being determined by this demon. Um, and it describes the demon's actions as his own. So to quote it, this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. So the first thing I wonder, just to make sure I'm, I'm comparing apples to apples, that I'm comparing determination to determination here, is... Um, let me ask you, on your view, to use J.P. Moreland's language, is there the same what it is like, uh, qualitative feel or qualitative texture to doing something under demon determination versus doing something under divine determination? Uh, I don't know. I've never been demon possessed myself. Do you have any personal experience? <laughs> <laughs> these, this is the thing. This is why these guys are so great and the tone is so i'll this is one of my favorite debates of the year i think oh yeah it's one of the best uh, i mean it's hard to say it was a real debate because it wasn't like they had rebuttals and uh, mm -hmm. closing statements and things like that but uh, in a sense we can still call it a debate and i think yeah. it's it's one of the most important ones uh in history because at least for me and you because we really care about these topics but i just got to say here that I think Guillaume Bignon is one of the most humorous philosophers out there. Even when I got, even when he disagrees with me, mm -hmm. and, you know, as I read his case against my, my views, right? He has written things specifically against Tim Stratton and my work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I read that stuff, even though I disagreed with him, the stuff that he would say would just make me laugh out loud. I love his humor. Um, and he's got a gift, but, but I was glad, yeah. um, to see Kirk bring up this, uh, this, what it is like experience or this, uh, uh you know, he brought up JP Moreland and this, uh, Moreland is discussed even in, in the, sorry to keep, uh, you know, promoting this paper, <laughs> but that's even something. Um, that, if that I they, had a paper on this subject with JP Moreland, I, it'd be every other sentence. I understand. Go ahead. <laughs> well, he's a, he's a, like, he's an American treasure. Yeah. Uh, so I do feel like that's what I'm doing, but, um, but yeah, Moreland talks about this phenomenological texture. Um, and, and Kirk brought this what it is like experience up. Um, and, and so I was glad to uh, glad to see him do that. Uh, which, by the way, I, you know, I, I just got to say that I did share this paper with Kirk as he was preparing for the debate, but <laughs> never really had a chance to go there. But um, uh, I could tell a few few places I'm like, yeah, he read the paper but <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> anyway. Good. You're trying to press me with an argument by analogy, right? To say that if we're determined by the demon and we cannot be morally responsible, then why would that be different for God? Or phrased symmetrically to say, if it's possible to be uh, morally responsible when God determines us to do something, then why is it not like, why don't we blame the demon possessed person for? their demon possession. So there's there's a couple of different ways of doing so. First of all, we could have a tracking condition, right? So the, the person could be unable to resist the activity of the demon, but having uh, freely brought this about, uh, there could be a tracking and so we could blame it on earlier choices. Yeah, so Tim, you know, I, this sounds like, um, when, I remember when I was really into this, when I was gonna debate using a free will argument and I read that uh, um, Oxford, uh, handbook on free will or whatever. And Robert Kane's section in there was really interesting. And he talked about these self forming moments or self forming actions. And, uh, yeah. this is if a person did think that, so even among libertarians, there are libertarians that think, and I'm certainly open to this, that even if 
certain things I do in my life <clears throat> are somewhat deterministic, even if that's not exactly the right term, but let's just go with it. Let's just grant a lot of what happens. Let's, let's just say, what if it were kind of deterministic where, and, and I, I, you can get there by thinking about something like when you go into the gas station and there's a double door there, um, you, you may, you, you may not feel, you may not have really felt like you made a very involved decision about which door you were going to go through. And this is kind of like the difference between what we could call picking, which is something you almost do instinctually and choosing, which might, might involve more deliberation. And, um, what if you, what if you, most, much of your life, even some of the, you know, morally significant things that you do are done during the period where you're doing, you're on, you're running more like on habit or whatever like that. And you don't really have robust libertarian freedom. Now, I don't think that's the case, but I'm open to there being periods like that or moments like that. Um, well, in such a case, how could we hold someone morally responsible for something they did during that time if they weren't libertarianly free or, or, or what we usually mean when we say that? And then the answer would be, well, if they have moments of libertarian freedom in their life, these become uh, self-forming actions where whatever you, the kind of person you make of yourself in those libertarian moments sets yeah. you on a course so that you can think of it this way. Here's an example that isn't quite the same, but it's similar enough that it gives you a, uh, the, the impression of it. Um, if you had a person who was drunk and when they're drunk, right. they do something morally significant. They, they, they punch someone or, or some, they commit some crime. <clears throat> well, are they morally responsible when we know they're not in their head, in their right head? Well, a lot of people will try to get off the hook morally and say, well, I was drunk, you know. But the reason that doesn't usually fly with most of us is because they made that decision to get drunk. And so right. that is um, that that's kind of the idea behind these moments of self forming action. And that sounds something like what's being said here. Perhaps the demon possessed person um, did something when they were not demon possessed to invite or in some way foster the situation that they're now in, which brings along with it all of these all of these horrible things that the demon works. Yeah, I think uh, the, the self-forming actions is right. There's times when uh, we can uh, humans can do things that are morally wrong. <laughs> so, you know, the, the drunk driver who runs over the pedestrian. And let's just say at that moment, he didn't have the ability to do otherwise, um, but he did have the ability to do otherwise leading up to that. He could have mm -hmm. said no to his second drink, um, for example, or his third drink or whatever, you know, uh, what, whatever led to him ultimately losing his libertarian freedom. And I, I have argued that one reason why uh, drugs and alcohol uh, shouldn't be abused um, you know, why, why you, I mean, uh, the Bible says don't get drunk on wine, but clearly Jesus, uh, drank wine and provided it, uh, for, uh, for others. Um, but we're not supposed to get drunk. Why is because I, I say that it, uh, tarnishes or, uh, damages the, the image of God in which we've been created. And that image or that likeness is what gives us this, the libertarian freedom and the rationality and the morality, uh, required uh, for some of these things. So when you lose the libertarian freedom, uh, you've given yourself over to other things. And that is, that's bad. That's a sin. Now, uh, I, I see the self-forming actions, uh, very similar to, uh, you know, that's, that's uh, self-forming actions is regarding morality, but then we have uh, something very similar called indirect doxastic voluntarism, which is regarding uh, rationality and our beliefs. And yeah, at the moment of belief, I, I usually, in the vast majority of cases, I don't have the libertarian freedom to believe otherwise. But during my evaluative and, uh, you know, my deliberations, and, you know, as I study, am I being careful or not? Am I letting my emotions or, you know, uh, what I've argued for in the past, am I, hold, am I digging in my heels, which I shouldn't be doing? Or, or, you know, not letting me be careful. If I'm doing these kinds of things, maybe, maybe somebody is jealous of another person, so they don't want them to be right. So they've got this emotional thing stopping them from being careful. Uh, these are mistakes we make along the way, leading to some of our beliefs. So I, I see self-forming actions and indirect doxastic voluntarism to be very similar. But anyway, let's just get back to this uh, debate here. 
uh, Guillaume is, is referencing uh, this tracking explanation. Um, but those seem to be libertarian choices. So this tracking explanation is not a good explanation for Guillaume to use uh, as, as he is an Ed guy, an exhaustive divine determinist. So I, I, um, I can see that, yeah, there's times when we're not free to choose otherwise, but we were free in a libertarian sense uh, go, going up to that uh, point. So, so I don't see how a determinist, somebody can, committed to exhaustive divine determinism, uh, can offer that uh, that model or that explanation. But leaving that for your side, uh, I think that my criteria for distinguishing cases of manipulation, at least in the uh, in the chapter on manipulation in my book, the 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 relevant difference that I bring between the cases of like mad uh, scientists uh, determining us to de manipulating us to do something is the God givenness of the impulses that we act upon, right? So the inclination the fact that we act on our God-given characters and desires. So that condition is still present to relevantly distinguish between the case of the demon-possessed person and the case of being determined by God and morally responsible. So I would say that, yeah, maybe the demon is determining uh, the outcome of the choice, and we could coherently say that the person is not morally responsible, assuming that there is no blameworthiness for being demon-possessed in the first place. All right, Tim, you take this one. Take it away. Well... It seems that on this view, then, that God determines Hitler's character and determines Hitler's wants and desires. And so what God caused and determined, in turn, goes on to determine the Holocaust. Thus, Hitler is caused and determined by God to torture and kill six million Jews. Now, this sounds like something a demon would determine a person to do, not what a maximally great being who is love would determine a person to do. So that that explanation just doesn't move me whatsoever. All right. So uh, let's keep trucking. Um, but if, if this is purely a taking over of their capacity, of their will, of their characters and desires, then there's a bypassing of God's character, God-given character and desire, which removes moral responsibility and is absent in the normal case of a free choice on Calvinism and compatibilism. So there's no incoherence in maintaining that, in maintaining that one is morally responsible and that the other one is not. All right. Now, this is getting into some terrain, Tim, that uh, you and I are used to talking about in the apologetic sphere, which is morality and all that sort of thing. So why don't you break this down for us? Well, it, it seems to me that uh, Bingon's view is that if something does not bypass what God has determined a person to think or do, then the person is responsible in a desert sense for what God determined the person to think and do. Now, here's the thing. Um, if Ed is true, then if something bypassed what God determined a person to think or do. Well, it was God who determined the so-called bypassing. So I don't think this gets the Ed advocate off of any hooks here. God determines the entire show if Ed is true. But let's, okay, so let's think about, I've been thinking about this since the night of the debate. And let's talk about this whole demon thing. I could be missing something here, but I suppose a demon who was not determined by God watched this debate and got some ideas. He then found a non-believing human who was also not determined by God, uh, playing with some Ouija boards and tarot cards. So since this human was making free but evil choices, this demon was able to possess this human. So the human then can be blamed for freely playing with these demonic devices, which ultimately opened the door for him and led to him being possessed. However, uh, now he cannot do other than what the demon determines him to do. Now, since the demon watched this debate, to stick it to Guillaume Bignon, the demon then determines the person who he possessed, uh, who was previously playing with Ouija boards and tarot cards. He determines this person to pray and ask Jesus to be the Lord of his life. So question, is this person saved? Well, I think most people are going to say, of course not. Why? Because this prayer was not up to him, but determined by the demon. So similarly, is a person determined by the Holy Spirit to pray and ask Jesus to be the Lord of his life saved? Well, I, I don't think so, because it was not up to the human, but determined 
by someone else. So what do you think, Braxton? Am I Dude, missing Dude, that's something? really creative. It That's fantastic. Well, <laughs> um, I, but the point you're trying to make is, does it work the other way, right? right uh, with the moral right. culpability, is that, or like with mm -hmm. the good and bad? Yeah, no, I think that's really good. I Let's, let's just let that hang in the air there and let people yeah. think about it. <laughs> All right, let's, let's keep trucking. And you can write a screenplay about that. That makes good fiction. But uh, let's go on to the next All clip. Right. So once again, if you fall short of using determinism language, you are finding yourself saying things that are equally true on Molinism, right? So if, if, we, if we take issue with the fact that somebody else is doing that thing as well, right? Uh, as the Calvinist would say, well, God is the one who, do, who does you know, the bringing about of the outcome of those choices, then the Molinist God does the same thing, right? He places us in circumstances that he knows we would, uh, in which he knows what we would do. And so it's very meaningful to say he makes it happen. He does it as well. Or like the Bible says that he does about evil, right? So he says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me, there's no God. I form light and I create darkness. Uh, I make well-being and I create calamity. Right? I kill and make alive. So he's, he's using active language of things saying, I do those things. Uh, and yet we both agree that he's not blameworthy for all those things. But his involvement in evil is described in very active terms of doing it. And so the Calvinist says, yes, that doing involves a determination. The Molinist says, no, it's not deterministic. But in that, I think that, again, the Molinist and Calvinist uh, shake hands over the fact that God does all those things. They just disagree about the means through which he's doing it, right? So the Molinist and the Calvinist do shake hands over the fact that God predestined all things, but we disagree over how God predestines all things. And the Molinist doesn't simply leave it at that. We explain exactly why God does not predestine all things via determinism. Right. Uh, determinism contradicts God's nature as a maximally great being. Determinism does not allow humans to experience the best kind of love. Determinism does not allow humanity to possess important kinds of rationality. Determinism ultimately makes God into a deity of deception, even if God is a deity of deception for morally sufficient reasons. And this ultimately leads to the idea that uh, we can't trust scripture and we don't even have assurance of salvation. So, uh, again, stay tuned. But there's, there's there's so many problems that come along with determinism. Now, the arguments uh, th that I make for these things can be found in my book, on my website, on my YouTube channel, and in my forthcoming paper with J.P. Moreland. As I explained, I think that... Um you're left with this dilemma when you read um, both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, that it's very clear that God cannot do evil, or at least would not do evil. But then on the other hand, you have these examples that you brought up. And scripture doesn't give us a way to reconcile that. And so it seems to me that part of loving God with all our minds, especially if we believe that God is the source of all truth, as Justin Martyr and Clement of Alexandria famously said, that all truth is God's truth. So all disciplines of knowledge emanate from God as the one divine source. And it seems to me that just like nobody would raise an eyebrow over using archeology span to explain an unsolved mystery in the Bible, this is done all the time, um, that no one should raise an eyebrow about using philosophy in order to say, well, look, um, in the biblical Are you under sense, the impression that I have a concern with philosophy here? <laughs> you, have you confused me with James White? Or? <laughs> no, I, I haven't confused you. I haven't confused you with James White. Uh, what, what I, I got to tell you what I, I just got to say that I love how Guillaume uh, kind of threw James White, his fellow Calvinist under the the bus here. Uh, but, but Guillaume is right in that James White does not understand, it seems, the importance of uh, theology's handmaiden, uh, which is philosophy. Guillaume Bignon, on the other hand, is, a like I said earlier, a top-level philosopher. Even if he's wrong about Calvinism, he's still a top-level philosopher. Uh, what would yeah. you add, Braxton? Well, just for anyone that has a problem with philosophy, and I think probably people that have watched this to this point are probably somewhat familiar with these concepts already, but 
philosophy is just inevitable. You're going to do philosophy. When you read the words on the page and begin to formulate ideas in your mind about what it means, you're already doing some philosophy. And so yeah. since that's going to happen, it's just best to make sure that it's good philosophy and not bad philosophy. You know, there's that famous old quote everybody says about good philosophy must exist if for no other reason that bad philosophy must be answered, right? <laughs> That's right. That's well said. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the implication of like the the activity of the Mormon is God in evil, right? So the um, maybe a, a good place to take this would be to discuss a little bit the uh, the argument by Greg Welty, the so-called bullet bill uh, argument. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the bullet bill paper uh, from? Yeah, I uh, I, I, I heard him give that paper at ETS, yes, right. or EPS, yeah. So, so, so without redoing the whole paper, I think that the, the simple point can be phrased uh, pretty succinctly, which is to say that when you consider, you know, our moral intuition about what makes somebody guilty of a murder, right, by firing a gun, um, we look at the situation where he's firing a gun, um, even if the um, bullet is standard and we're just facing the normal laws of physics, that person is not maintaining the laws of physics in place so that technically he's not guaranteeing, he's not strongly actualizing the killing of the person because he's not in control of those laws of nature, which could be altered and therefore prevents the bullet from killing the target. But then without having to bend the laws of nature, you could envision the scenario where he fires a bullet that has indeterministic free will, right? So the, the bullet bill goes and then has the freedom to refrain from killing the target but in fact does not refrain, we would still say that the person who fired the gun intuitively is morally responsible, especially if that person knew that the bullet would not refrain from killing the target. So we have somebody who's firing the gun with the intention of killing somebody with a bullet that could uh, deviate, so it's not deterministic, but the killer is knowing what the bullet would do in those circumstances, and he knows that he would kill the target. And I think that those intuitions in place, we would say, well, that person is morally guilty, right? And so similarly, the God of Molinism finds himself putting us in circumstances in which, yes, we are indeterminist, uh, we are indeterministically doing what we do, but he knows what we would do. And it seems like by the same moral intuitions as the case of the bullet bill, we would be saying that the God of Molinism is morally blameworthy. Now, obviously, I don't say that the God of Molinism would be blameworthy mm -hmm. for doing this. Why? Because I say that God has morally sufficient reasons and mm -hmm. he's after the greater good. Yeah, I've been uh, uh, grappling with uh, Greg Welty's bullet bill thought experiment for a few years now. Uh, I actually wrote uh, an article on my website uh, back when nobody really was paying any attention to what I was doing. <laughs> um, and, but, but Greg Welty then quickly responded and wrote, something uh, responding to me. And I, I saw how I needed to tighten some things up. I wrote a part two. He's never responded to that yet, but I think the part two is pretty strong. But I think the greatest defeater of the bullet bill thought experiment is two of the most successful movies in the history of the world. And this is for you, Braxton. Thank it's you. the Avengers. Yeah, Avengers, oh. Infinity War and Avengers and Game. I love Sorry, it when you not... bring superheroes into theology <laughs> discussions. Well, hold on tight. So <laughs> Bignon says that people have this intuition that the person who fired the gun, as it were, uh, who knew the evil that would freely occur is still morally responsible. But that, that's simply false. And that's why millions upon millions upon millions of people cheered for Dr. Strange and recognized him as the hero who saved the Marvel Comics universe. Uh, it's also why the same audience of millions upon millions re realized in Captain America uh, Civil War that Bucky was not morally responsible when he was causally determined and mind controlled by Hydra to kill Tony Stark's parents. And Tony Stark everybody knew it, was blaming the wrong guy who used, right? The, uh, he should have blamed the guy who used Bucky as a tool to make evil happen, right? Everybody knew this. Everybody had this intuition. Um, now, Dr. Strange, on the other hand, knew all the evil that would freely occur if he actualized a specific freedom or a specific feasible freedom permitting 
future into existence. Strange did not deterministically mind control Thanos, but he did fire the gun, as it were, and created a world by doing the unthinkable, at least from our limited perspective. And he gave Thanos the time stone. By doing this, Dr. Strange created a world in which he knew how Thanos would freely choose, which includes all the evil that he did in, in uh, Avengers Endgame, uh, along with everyone else. He knew how everyone was going to freely choose, which ultimately led to the best feasible uh, freedom permitting endgame. And everyone knows that Strange should not be held responsible, at least morally responsible, in a blameworthy so sense. <laughs> Everybody knows that Strange shouldn't be blamed in a, in a dessert sense for the evil that Thanos freely chose to do, right? That's, that's on Thanos and Thanos alone. But we all realize, everybody had the intuition, millions upon millions upon millions, that, that Dr. Strange should be praised for creating the one feasible freedom permitting world where the evil of Thanos is ultimately defeated and all the saints are raised. I mean, does that sound familiar? That's straight from scripture. So uh, those who offer the bullet bill story uh, like to assert that we have these intuitions that the one who fired the gun should be blameworthy. Uh, but the Avengers and Dr. Strange have shattered that myth since 2019. So here's the deal on Ed Calvinism. God is the necessary and sufficient condition for all the evil in the world. On Molinism, however, God is simply and merely the necessary condition for all the evil in the world. And that's a vital and relevant difference. I think that's also why uh, the millions upon millions of comic book fans realized uh, that Hydra was to blame, not Bucky, and realized that even though Doctor Strange predestined um, Thanos' evil in uh, Avengers Endgame, he didn't determine it. And that's why, uh, because he had the Endgame in mind, he should be praised. So, I don't know. What do you think? I've agreed with it every time I've heard you say it. I just want to know how you convinced a major motion picture company to illustrate Molinism in an action series. But Well, let me tell you, uh, I'm not 100% certain on this, but I do know that Scott Derrickson, who developed Dr. Strange's character and was the, uh, the director of the first Dr. Strange movie, not the second, but he was the one that initially developed the character. Guess, guess where he... Uh, graduated from. I think he, he's got a, a master's degree in theology and philosophy from Biola University. I figured. Uh, yeah. So he learned wow. from William Lane Craig and JP Moreland and he oh, knew man. all about middle knowledge. Scott Derrickson gave uh, uh, Dr. Strange the power of middle knowledge to save the universe. So it's just really amazing. Uh, Have you ever been able to inquire about whether that that is why he did that or like where he got the idea or whatever. I haven't had an opportunity to talk to him yet. I'm really looking forward uh, to that time. I'm praying that yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. And he would probably be thrilled to see how you've used all that stuff. Well, I hope so. <laughs> well, I don't know. He may not be a Christian. Is he a Christian? No. You know. Well, I mean, he. I, I'm assuming he is uh, uh, a Christian of at least some sort. <laughs> if he went yeah. to Biola. He went to Biola. Um, but, some kind of Christian. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Who knows about those Hollywood types? You just right. Know. Yeah. Okay, well, Tim. Uh, I want. I, I do want to sing uh, some of Bignon's uh, praises here in this next clip. So let's take a look at it. I will say yeah. this, I, and I think I've said this uh, myself a number of times. Um, if uh, you cannot be convinced that God can be morally perfect while determining everything that happens then I would rather you hold on before you affirm that and you maintain that God exists. And then we'll see if I can convince you of Calvinism later on down the line. But I would prefer, <laughs> you, being, I would prefer you being a Christian rather than a Christian non-Calvinist rather than an atheist. So we put the doctrines in the proper order. And, yeah. uh, you know, I've, I've had plenty of ministerial conversations where people struggling about questions around free will. And part yeah. of my evangelistic appeal is to tell them, look, I'm pretty convinced that Calvinism is true, but um, you, know, you don't have to be a Calvinist to be a Christian. There's plenty of sensible, smart Christians who disagree with Calvinism. Mm -hmm. huh, like Kirk McGregor might even be one of them. God knows. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, 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 there's, there's a value in ministry in saying, look, this is a difficult question. It's a philosophical question of 
very practical importance. So it's not one that has no importance, right? So uh, that's why I, I like the topic. That's why I discuss it. That's why I debate it. But uh, it's not one that's a, that the faith hangs or falls on. And so I will mm -hmm. happily point a non-believer who is considering Christianity to the existence of non-Calvinist Christians uh, that have a very sensible position as well. So that's my more practical side of things. You know, Tim, I said something similar to that right after my debate with Matt Dillahunty several years ago. I had a young woman uh, approach me after the debate and say, well, listen, you use this argument from free will and uh, maybe I would be a Christian, but I'm a determinant. I, I believe determinism is true and I don't mm -hmm. think I'm ever going to be convinced otherwise. And I said, well, listen, the first thing out of my mouth was, well, listen, there uh, is a rich tradition of determinists in Christianity, and uh, those are Calvinists. I said, have you heard of that? Yeah, I've heard of Calvin. I said, well, look, I'm not a Calvinist, and I think it's actually a pretty important issue but where we disagree, but I'd much rather you be a Calvinist than an atheist. And yeah. that's what Guillaume said in reverse. And so, yeah, um, I appreciate that. Uh, that. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to say, I loved uh, Bignon's response here, and I've seen him uh, say similar things elsewhere. And I, I just got to say, I love this about Guillaume Bignon. And in fact, uh, I wrote a, a blog article uh, once singing his praises because of this. It's called, uh, I think it's called Sharing the Gospel in Back Pocket Apologetics. If anybody wants to read it, you can find it at freethinkingministries.com. But in fact, well, I got to tell you this. I read. Yeah, hold, hold on, hold on. You, you're. I feel like when you write an article, because I've looked at them, they'll sometimes have like diagrams and equations. I mean, you're a smart guy. You're you're the smart guy guy. But here's yeah. the thing. I think you spend way more time than anything else on the titles of your articles, <laughs> <laughs> because they're always these puns and they have like layers of meaning and all these kind of things. Anyway, back to Bignon. Um, no, I'm, yeah, I want to sing his praises, and I just want to say that I uh, recently wrote a chapter in a forthcoming uh, book where many authors uh, collaborated, and and I actually bring Guillaume Bignon up here, and it, it's on apologetics. It's an apologetics book, um, but I say that we can all learn from him and follow his lead on this on this matter, uh, whether it's about models of hell, uh, the age of the earth. Uh, even evolution or, or whatever the case might be, if there's a sticking point for a non-believer, a Christian is free to remove uh, that stumbling block by offering other views that fit under the big umbrella of Christianity, these other possible views that you don't think are true, but you can't completely rule them out. And you can give those uh, to other people, you know, views that you do not personally hold, but do not violate the gospel. Now, I think uh, Guillaume Bignon is uh, providing an awesome example here. He doesn't think we have free will in the libertarian sense, but if he runs into a non-Christian and sees that they could not get behind the idea of God determining Hitler's Holocaust, then he'll say, well, here, I don't hold this view. In fact, I argue against it, but here's a view that you might like uh, called Molinism. And it shows how you've got libertarian freedom and mm -hmm. how, uh, uh, you know, God is God's still predestining it without determining it. Um, he'll give that to him because Guillaume cares more about their souls than he does his view. Amen. And let me just say, amen to that. I, I hope to follow Bignon's lead here. And, and I have, I've done similar things. Uh, and I do, you know, with hell, let's bring up our, our colleague, Chris Date. I don't hold Chris Date's view. I do not affirm it as true, but he's convinced me that it ought to be on the table of possibilities. And so I say his view is my fallback position now. And not only that, even though it's not my, it's not Tim Stratton's view, I keep it in my back pocket. This is the back pocket apologetics. When I run into somebody and say, I just could not uh, believe in a God who would send anybody to suffer for eternity. I'll say, oh, well, let me give you Chris Date's view. And I've seen that work. So anyway, mm -hmm. that's what I mean by back pocket apologetics. Guillaume Bignon does an awesome job, and I think everybody should follow his lead. Yeah, man. Yeah, I remember Tim Barnett at the Rethinking Hell conference in 2020, I think, maybe, in Seattle. 
Um, and he, he, I, I think that was kind of his point and he called it doing an end run around this problem, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. It, well, and I mean, look, we're trying to get them to accept Christ. We're not trying to make a carbon copy of our doctrinal positions. And, right. um, that's an important thing. All right, let's keep trucking. Maybe there's one line of positive argumentation that I can try to uh, corner you on a little yeah. bit and see uh, sure. what kind of answers you, you do provide. Um, yeah. so it's, it's in the, uh, Inev- inevitability of evil. So this is where the evil, the question of evil might be um, a difficulty for the non-Calvinist. And it's in answering to what point uh, sin is unavoidable for a fallen human being. Uh, on biblical terms, uh, I think that we would be committed to saying that it's impossible to live a fully sinless life. And I've used this, as you've probably read in my book, as an argument that uh, Martin Luther has used, that Jonathan Edward has used as well, and given it a little bit of a philosophical rigorous formulation. But it seems to me like if we are affirming that it's impossible for a human being to live a fully sinless life, then we are denying the principle of alternate possibility, which says that you cannot be morally responsible unless you have the ability to do otherwise. Because it seems to me we are blameworthy for our failure to live a sinless life, and yet it's impossible, given our fallen nature, to live a sinless life. So it would follow that we're either not like that, that we don't have um, that we don't have the ability to live a sinless life uh, and that it would follow that moral responsibility does not require the ability to do otherwise. But if that's the case, then incompatibilism is not true because incompatibilism requires that we have the ability to do otherwise. Uh, when we exercise our free will. So I'm curious whether you, which of those premises you would grant, namely, yeah. would you would you grant that it's categorically impossible for a sinner to live a sinless life? Uh, would you grant that a moral responsibility does not require the ability to do otherwise? Or would you grant that the principle of alternate possibility being false um, entails that incompatibilism is false? And obviously if incompatibilism yeah. is false, then modernism is false, right? So yeah, so Tim, the thing here that I, I find interesting about, I kind of feel the same way that Kirk McGregor does about this, because though we're told by Paul that it's going to be the case that that you know all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and all those kind of things, everyone ends up sinning. But that's a different question mm-hmm. from whether everyone must sin. So right. when I think about uh, particular instances of sin, the last time you were on the show, we looked at a passage of Scripture that we think the best explanation of this passage of Scripture indicates that um, in any particular instance where y- you might sin, there's a way for you not to sin. In other mm-hmm. words, you don't have to sin in that particular instance. Well, if that's true of that particular instance and all other particular instances, well, then that means that in every part- I could I could not sin in ten of these cases or a hundred of these cases or a million of these. Ca- well, you know what? If I if it's logically possible for me not to sin in any particular case, then it's logically possible that I might never sin. Okay. (laughs) The fact is that doesn't mean that anyone will ever do that except Jesus, but Jesus did do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that the point of saying, well, look, the Bible says that you shouldn't sin, but everyone ends up sinning at some point, or, you know, doesn't, doesn't that mean that, that you're commanded to do something, punished for doing something you were, and you couldn't do otherwise? No, I think you could do otherwise. It's just that we all do sin. And yeah. so uh, we have to, we have to face that. Um, what's your answer to this? Yeah. So let me uh, wrestle with this a little bit. I think the first thing to say is this: uh, that that what Bignon is uh, offering here is regarding salvation issues, and you know, mere Molinism, as I argue in this book, is not a soteriological system. So a Molinist would be free to agree with everything Bignon is saying here and still maintain his Molinism. So if you agree that it's just logically impossible uh, to not commit a sin or, or whatever, you can, that's all right. That doesn't mean you don't have libertarian freedom in other areas of life and that God doesn't predestine those. Uh, so anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that five point Calvinism is not incompatible with the two essential ingredients of mere Molinism. But with that said, I, I, don't agree with everything beyond is saying here. It's, it is impossible for a person who is born separated from God to live a life that's not separated from God, right? At least until God makes it possible to not be separated from him. Um, so I think that puts a different, 
uh, spin on it here. And just as I do not think that one should be blamed for being born with a certain color of skin, I do not think one should be blamed for being born separated from God. That's not up to them. You know, as Lady Gaga would say, I was born that way. Uh, maybe that's a horrible reference. If so, just strike it from the record. Hey, I if, apologize. If, if William Lane Craig can talk about Lady Gaga, you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, w what we are blamed for is a libertarian free rejection of God's revelation, a rejection of his love, a rejection of his offer of grace. What We are free in a categorical sense to reject God's love and grace or not. Now, with that said, let's think about the possibility of sinning or not sinning. So in a logically strict sense, there's no contradiction in saying that Joe refrained from sin at time T1. There's no logical contradiction in saying Joe refrained from sin at time T2. And likewise, there's no contradiction in saying that Joe refrained from sin at time T3. We can go on and on and on. So we can apply this to all moments on the timeline. So with that said, it seems possible in a strict sense that a person could refrain from all specific sins at all moments of the timeline. God simply knows that no one would or will, right? And Kirk even brought this up. Uh, and, and I think this is what you're saying, that God mm -hmm. simply knows, uh, and a God with middle knowledge would know this, God simply knows that no one would or will freely in a libertarian sense live a sinless life besides Jesus. Now, that does not make it impossible to live a sinless life. It does, however, make it infeasible. But those are different things, even mm -hmm. though they're related. So, now, I would, um, I, I would say it like this. No feasible freedom permitting world exists where any human besides Jesus lives a sinless life. Mm -hmm. um, so with that said, do possible worlds exist? Yes. Mm -hmm. possible do feasible worlds. worlds exist? No. What's that? Po yeah, I was going to say possible world exists, right? Yeah, but possible not worlds world. exist. Yeah. yeah, possible worlds exist where Adam lives a, a, a sinless life. Does a feasible world exist where he does so? Uh, I would say probably not. So let me add this caveat. Uh, prior to grasping God's revelation and his love and his grace, it would be impossible to keep the greatest commandment, right? To love God <laughs> with every aspect of your existence. Now, that does not mean that you cannot refrain from all these other sins like theft or lying or adultery. I mean, atheists do that much on a regular basis. I know a lot of atheists that are much nicer than Christians. I'll tell you this, the Christians who disagree with me online are much worse than any atheists I've ever debated. Um, yeah. So atheists can be very nice. They can refrain from all kinds of uh, sin and they do, um, but they're not keeping the greatest command, definitely, even if they kept every other sin. So I just say this, uh, an unregenerate sinner can keep the rest of the law uh, besides loving God with all of his or her mind, at mm -hmm. least prior to coming to the realization that God exists. But that's why theologians and pastors discuss uh, things such as the, uh, the age of accountability. Um, so that means that one should not be blamed for not loving God before they are even aware of the concept of God. But as Kirk points out in his response, this does not magically get you to the Father in heaven, right? God is under no obligation to metaphysically transport anyone, including those who love him, into the Father's presence in heaven. No, uh, no one, even if they somehow survived all the moments on the timeline without acting upon a specific sin, can work their way to heaven, right? Good works are as dirty rags, as it says in Isaiah. So it's only by God's grace that anyone gets to the Father, as Jesus describes in John 14, 6. So let me answer Guillaume's three questions um, to Kirk, that he, that he asked to Kirk. He said, number one, would you grant that it's categorically impossible for a sinner to live a sinless life? And I would first appeal to the age of accountability and say, at that point, it is possible, but not feasible, to live a sinless life. But God knows no one would or will freely live a sinless life unless perhaps at the moment, I mean, think about this, at the moment they became aware of God, 
they gave their life to God and they spent the unaware they only had five minutes left to live and they spent the entirety of that five minutes uh, worshiping God. Um, then it seems, okay, uh, somebody, uh, there's, there's no logical impossibility there. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's always counterexamples that we can come up with. So Yeah, well, to bring it back full circle, I, you know, so what we've just said about the situation on earth is basically this. It's, it's logically possible that, the, that, that someone could go and go through their life and in each particular instance, not sin, but it's infeasible and uh, we're told it, do, it won't ever happen except with yeah. Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think the inverse is true. In, for me, I think the inverse is true in heaven. So I, I think that with the free will in heaven, not to get off on too much of a rabbit trail, but just to say, like, there's some people that think, well, it's like it just won't be available. Sin won't be available. I, I have a problem with that. It's like, well, the Diet Coke's not there anymore, so you're not free, or you can't choose the Diet Coke, but you're still free. I, the thing about it is sin isn't like an object you can just remove. It's more of a moment-by-moment a, a moment, uh element of your life where you choose in each moment to obey God um, or not in, in particular things. And so yeah. I don't think it can be just as simple as removing something uh, for me. Uh, I also don't want to say that compatibilism is true in heaven because I don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think the scriptural evidence demonstrates that. And I, and I would have the same philosophical concerns. So for me, what, what I think is, is it logically possible someone would sin? Yes but we're told it won't ever happen and the idea is absurd. So it's exactly the inverse, I think, yeah. of yeah. what we have here on earth. Yeah. Yep, I've, I've argued that much and have a video on my YouTube channel uh, discussing that uh, where I, mm -hmm. I do point out that we have, there is nothing deterministically preventing us from rebelling against God just as uh, uh, Satan and a third of all the angels did um, when we mm -hmm. find ourselves in his presence. Um, however, uh, that's, I think what Paul's dis discussing in second Corinthians four seventeen. that's why we have the blessing of suffering and we get to live for a few decades, um, on this rock, experiencing all kinds of affliction, which prepares us to not take, uh, paradise in the very presence of God and his love for granted and wreck it. Um, uh, you know, Adam and Adam and Eve, Satan, and a third of all the angels all wrecked paradise in the presence of God. Uh, they took it for granted and wrecked it. You and I, after experiencing all this pain, evil and suffering, we've learned freely how stupid it is not to live according to the law of Christ. And so even though we could uh, mm -hmm. rebel in heaven, we never would. And, um, you know, yeah, this has been such a full discussion right here about the, this issue for what could be a clip in the future i'll just go ahead and say an example of what you're saying right now or an analogy and i didn't i didn't come up with this i i heard it from donald j johnson and i'm sure others have said it but uh, the idea that like my kids when they were very small um both of them picked sand up out of the sandbox put it in their mouth to eat it um and they both spit it out immediately right it didn't take long for them to realize that's disgusting and i'm not going to do that again um now maybe they did it again but I don't stay up at night worried that when they're 30 years old, that they're going to be eating <laughs> buckets of sand while they're watching TV, right. and destroying their body because, because it's, it could it happen. Is it logically impossible that, that one of my daughters at 30 could pick up sand and start eating it at 30 years old? Well, yeah, it's logically possible. Someone could do it. It's not impossible. Mm -hmm. It's, but, the, but, the, but, but they won't. <laughs> and the idea is absurd, right? Yeah. So I think that our understanding of sin, not only from the lived life here on earth, um, stories about other people's lives, particularly, you know, if people die as infants and they don't have that time to learn in that way. Well, still they, they can hear the stories of what's happened and, and things like that. And I think, of course, then the being glorified and in the presence of the Lord, um, I think all of that will be enough that uh, it will we'll see how absurd it's like eating sand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> well, all right. Let's, let's keep trucking to, then. Yeah. Yeah. The second question he asks, Kirk, he says, would you grant that moral responsibility does not require the ability to do otherwise? And I just say that although I believe we do have alternative possibilities when it comes to soteriological matters. For the sake of argument, I could grant that we are not morally responsible for, for salvation and damnation issues. However, 
In all other areas of life, moral responsibility requires the ability to do otherwise. And it seems like Paul makes that clear and uh, seems like Moses even uh, implies that as well in the Old Testament. So then moving to his third question, he says, would you grant that the principle of alternate uh, possi possibilities being false entails that incompatibilism is false? And I guess I'd just say that um, one can deny alternative possibilities in one area of life while affirming them in another area of life. And Greg Kokel is a wonderful example of this. He affirms five-point tulip Calvinism and is a determinist when it comes to salvation. However, he argues for libertarian freedom in other areas of life, like the ability to rationally infer and affirm better and best explanations. So, you know, I like to bring up the example of J. Warner Wallace being able to solve cold case murders while he was still an atheist, right? He might not have been able to reason to God, but he was able to solve, he was able to use his libertarian freedom to rationally infer who killed this guy, right? So, so it's, anyway, it's vital to differentiate between moral responsibility and epistemic responsibility or, or mm -hmm. rational responsibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that said, um, want to listen to Kirk's response? Well, there are two ways I would try to stop it. Um, the first way is simply to say that in the literature, um, the principle of alternative possibilities has been used in two ways. One is the way in which you've just defined it, where your understanding of the principle of alternate possibilities is about moral responsibility. Um, and that's not where I go with it. I, I kind of shy away from those definitions of the principle of alternate possibilities. I, I tend to lean toward those that make the principle of alternate possibilities about the definition of freedom. So when I say the principle of alternate possibilities, I'm not talking about moral responsibility here. I'm saying, you know, let's let's concede with your book that, you know, the sinners are responsible, you know. But I would say a person is free if and only if he sometimes could have thought or done otherwise, where the antecedent conditions like his inner desires, his belief desire set, etc., are insufficient to determine or necessitate the agent's choice. Again, moral responsibility is not the only important good that libertarian freedom provides, right? So uh, one can grant for the sake of argument that humans are not morally responsible in a desert sense for their salvation or damnation, but that does not mean that they are not morally responsible for other things, right? Such as the Calvinist who chooses to commit adultery or the Arminian who robs the bank, right? According to Paul, they had the ability to choose the way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and they failed to do so. Thus, the Calvinist and the Arminian here are both blameworthy for those specific sins. And moreover, we can't forget about the important kinds of rationality that require libertarian freedom, which I don't know if I told you this, but it's actually the main focus of my forthcoming paper I co-authored with J.P. Moreland. The, the freedom is a necessary condition for moral responsibility, is it not? Right. Uh, typically, there are two kinds of things that are necessary for us to be blameworthy or praiseworthy. One is that we would have epistemic conditions fulfilled, that we know some of the relevant facts, right? So that uh, if I pour uh, sugar in my wife's coffee, but unbeknownst to me, it's been replaced by poison, I'm killing my wife, but I'm not morally blameworthy for it because I didn't have knowledge of some of the relevant facts, right? So there's epistemic conditions. And then there's metaphysical freedom conditions, which is that we need to uh, properly, freely choose the actions that we do if we are going to be uh, blameworthy for them. And if we are lacking the freedom condition, right, if we suffer from something like coercion or manipulation or um, you know, hypnosis, uh, those kinds of conditions remove our moral responsibility because we do not satisfy the control conditions for moral responsibility. So epistemic and freedom conditions are both necessary for moral responsibility. So when you do define free will in a way that's perfectly acceptable to me as a, you know, as as a as coming from a Molinist, to define free will as this categorical ability to sometimes do otherwise than we do while holding in place all causally relevant antecedent factors, yeah, that yeah. freedom description 
that uh, seems to me is a necessary condition for more responsibility. But if that's the kind of free will that you take, it does lead to having to say that the sinner has the ability to live a sinless life or they could not be blameworthy for it. And that's the dilemma I'm trying to press. Well, this, Tim, is all, I mean, if there was ever an issue for you to speak to, this is it. So go. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think that the, the PAP, the the PAP or the principle of alternative possibilities or the ability to do otherwise is the foundational issue here. It seems that a necessary condition for moral responsibility is that one cannot be deterministically prevented from doing otherwise, especially by the one judging the person for not doing otherwise. Right now, Guillaume and I even had a brief Twitter exchange not too long ago on this topic topic and I, I explained this to him. So let me say that again. A necessary condition for moral responsibility is that one cannot be deterministically prevented from doing otherwise, especially by the one judging the person for not doing otherwise. So like I, I do personally think that we do possess the ability to do otherwise at the moment of moral choices um, and as you know, first Corinthians 10, 13. Uh, but but foundationally beneath that is that for moral responsibility to maintain a person being judged cannot be deterministically prevented by the same judge to not do otherwise. And I think most right. people are right. Most people are going to see how silly and absurd that would be. And I'm pretty sure that the vast majority of folks are going to share that intuition. And And I will argue that those who hold a different intuition, determinists, cannot trust their intuitions. But that's just me. So uh, what do you think? Because those intuitions are determined. Right, <laughs> right. Along with everything else they think or do. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep, yep, all right. By a deity, uh, by a deity of deception who determines all Christians to have some false intuitions, especially on theological matters. Uh, I, I would say the exhaustive divine determinist, um, they don't have that at their disposal to say, mm -hmm. well, I just don't have that intuition. Right. That's going to blow up in their face, um, mm -hmm. I believe. And I think uh, JP and I have uh, been able to demonstrate that a bit. But yeah. Stay yeah, I heard, for the that great, I heard you have a paper with him coming out. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's let's jump back in. First of all, it's not entirely clear to me that um that either that the doctrine of original sin is true i come out of an, an anabaptist tradition um which very much like the eastern orthodox tradition doesn't necessarily subscribe to the doctrine of original sin and i would think that it's perfectly it's it's possible for a, a person to live a sinless life um, I think Jesus proved that. And if someone said, well, that's because Jesus had a different kind of nature than ours, I think that's refuted by Paul in Romans 8, where Paul says that he took on the likeness of our sinful flesh. And he repeats the word sinful in the Greek twice, just to hammer it home, that he had the same kind of nature that we did, and yet proved that one could live a sinless life. And I would say that makes us even more morally culpable. But as I said, I don't think that leads to Pelagianism. Um, as I read Pelagius, um, for example, his commentary on, on the book of Romans written in around the year 410, and I um, look at what Pelagius taught, it seems to me you could summarize Pelagius's, it's not really a syllogism, but what he was saying in two steps. He was saying, first, human beings have libertarian freedom, Therefore, we should use our libertarian freedom to be good enough to earn our own salvation. And what I'm saying is that one is true, but two is false. How on earth could we use our libertarian freedom to earn our salvation? You seem to think that living a sinless life would earn salvation. Where, where on earth does that idea come from, I'm wondering? I mean, salvation is such a good that I can't think of anything human beings could do, including living a sinless life, that would ever merit it. And so I would say that Augustine made the error 
of saying, all right, I'm not just going to deny premise two. I'm just not going to deny step two. I'm going to nip the nip this thing in the bud and deny premise one and to say, you don't have a libertarian freedom and then introduce um, his concept of original sin. He coins the phrase and that therefore you can't be good enough to earn your own salvation rather than simply saying, look, I don't care whether you could live a sinless life or not. You still can't merit your own salvation. Um, that, that's just categorically impossible. It's not the kind of thing you can merit. So, Tim, you wanted to cover this clip. And so what what are you what strikes you about this? Yeah, well, this goes back to my point that it's metaphysically impossible for any human to work their way to God, even a little bit. I mean, so God, by his grace, chooses to transport those who love him into his presence. But he's under no obligation to do so. So God must do all the work. And by his grace, he chooses to do all the work. So, look, I'm a, uh, I like to say I'm a, I'm a monergistic Molinist times two. Right? For two reasons, I'm a monergist and a Molinist. So, um, first, I affirm Ken Keithley's ambulatory model, which shows that as long as one freely does not do anything, the Calvinist says, well, you can't do anything. I'm like, yeah, as long as you don't do anything, then we will eventually find ourselves in a love relationship with God. Um, but that requires libertarian freedom. But that doesn't mean you're actively choosing anything. God's doing all the work there, getting you uh, to fall in love with them as long as you don't do anything. So I, again, I want to point people to uh, Kenneth Keithley's book, Salvation and Sovereignty, and his ambulatory model. Now, second, once we find ourselves oh, in a love quick, relationship. Oh, real quick, I finally found a spot. Yeah, I cover the ambulatory model in this new oh. book, Todos hey. Podem Ser Salvos. <laughs> Sorry, Spanish-speaking nice. friends, if I butchered that. This is a book that I have a chapter in uh, from Wittfenstock, although this is verbum publications, probably in relationship with Wittfenstock. Uh, this is the Spanish-speaking version of the book I'm in, uh, Anyone Can Be Saved, edited by David Allen, Eric Hankins, and a uh, recent guest on Trinity Radio, Adam Harwood. So anyway, just wanted to throw that out there. A great place to get the ambulatory model. But of course, you should go to Ken Keithley for that uh, as he's the, the one that's known for making that popular. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, hey, uh, there's a gift for your Spanish speaking friends, right? Um, <laughs> that's right. And, and uh, my second edition of the Mere Molinism book, uh, there's plans... Uh, for that to be translated into Spanish. Oh, it well. had to be so. about you again, Tim. It couldn't just, this one oh, couldn't just be about my book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's keep trucking. <laughs> All right. Uh, I just want to say that, so the second reason why I'm a monergistic Molinist here is once we find ourselves in a love relationship with God, uh, we are still utterly powerless, right? Utterly powerless to get to God. And God's under no obligation to get us to him into his presence. So God yeah. has to do all the work and we are at the mercy of what God freely chooses to do. You, we can't do anything to get to God, right? Mm -hmm. Even those who love God with all their mind, with all their soul, with all, all their heart and all their strength, they can't get to God. It's not like they can get in a spaceship and go find him. No, yeah. you are a hundred percent at the mercy of God. Uh, to, for him to metaphysically and miraculously transport you into his presence. So, yeah, fortunately for us, God, because God is love, you know, First John 4, 8, uh, and, and by his love and by his grace, God does all the work and miraculously transports those who have not rejected God's love and grace into his presence for eternity. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a monergist for a couple different reasons and a Molinist. Amen. Yeah. Um, we talked about that recently with David Allen, so uh, you'll have to check out that episode. Also, David Allen, a new Trinity adjunct professor. What I want to ask is salvation from what? If there is no original sin and the person lives a sinless life, what do they need to be saved from? Right? They, they, are, they don't deserve the wrath of God. They've least lived sinlessly. Right. Every human, sans Adam and Eve, uh, have been born separated from God. So we come into existence 
not knowing that we were created on purpose and for the specific purpose of loving God and others. That's why we exist. And we come into existence completely unaware of this objective purpose that we were created for. Objective purpose and this objective mark that we were created to hit. So, of course, we are going to miss the mark. That's what it means to sin. We're going to miss the mark if we do if we don't know uh, that there is an objective target in the first place. And this is why we need time to learn and why we need God's revelation. And this is also why most theologians would affirm something along the lines of an age of accountability. Um, you're not morally blameworthy for missing the mark when you're born and come into existence, not even knowing there was a mark to hit in the first place. But once you learn of this, now you're, you're accountable. So, God saves us from living an eternal, meaningless life of missing the mark. He doesn't have to do that, right? He's under no, un, no obligation. But God saves us from a purposeless life, a meaningless life of missing the mark uh, for eternity. The mark is the objective purpose in which we were created to attain, to live in loving fellowship with God and everyone else who loves God in perfect paradise, in God's presence, free from all suffering and affliction. This is what God saves us to. What God saves us from is an eternal life of purposelessness and meaninglessness, an infinite future separated from God's love and everyone else who loves God. But remember, Love, that's why you exist. The best kind of love requires libertarian freedom. And Kirk makes a similar point in the next clip. It seems to me you can say that we are saved from um, the fact of just sort of the, the distance, you might say, between ourselves and God. That there's this huge distance between us and God. And it seems like unless God grants us something to overcome that distance, something that we cannot earn, then we, we do need to be safe from that um, if that distance is not to continue um, to be there. All right, Tim, um, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I just think uh, Kurt gives a, a great response and it kind of um, just reiterates what I said there, there's this, uh, this distance, this epistemic distance, um, in which we come into existence. And, uh, I don't think we're morally responsible, uh, for not knowing about God's existence when we come into existence, <laughs> right? When we first come in, we need God's revelation. We need a uh, uh, natural revelation and ultimately special revelation, but God closes that gap for us. And once that gap is closed and we have that revelation, now we're held accountable to what we do with God, specifically what we do with Jesus. Little local trivia, just about 30 minutes from where I'm sitting right now is where Paul Tillich is buried. And there is an incredible statue of his head there oh. in the town of New Harmony. Uh, but in any case, let's just keep on trucking. Secondly, I could say, well, why not? Suppose you're right in what you say. Um, suppose your reading of Pelagianism is right and my reading is wrong. Well, then why, why couldn't you suppose a doctrine of original sin according to which um, it's, it's not possible for a, a, a sinner to live a, 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 or a fallen human being to live a sinless life. But I don't see how that refutes um, what I've laid out as libertarian freedom. I mean, how does that show that like the, the, the sinner sort of in his room, you know, doesn't have the freedom to like stay there and watch some porn, or he also could have the freedom to just do nothing, or he has the freedom to curse God, or he has the freedom to go out and rob a liquor store. I mean, how does that remove his freedom from being able to choose between a range of alternatives? I just don't see that it does. 
Yeah, and, and here that would be because the uh, alternatives, if they're all sinful, then they're not morally relevant, right? So the ability to do otherwise that's required by this principle of alternate possibility is one in which the person does morally significantly different than they do in the actual scenario. So that's something that you can appreciate if you were to extend that view to me, right? To say, okay, I'm, my view is deterministic. So I'm saying that there's only one thing that the sinner does and it's alleged that it's removing the blameworthiness of the sin when there's only one thing that they could do. Well, imagine that now I tweak my Calvinist view just a little bit and I said, no, 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 actually, there's a million ways that they could do the exact same sin, uh, that they could do it just a little bit differently, right? So, I mean, you could imagine like if the sin is lying, I could say exactly the same lie, but uh, saying it slightly <laughs> faster, like a fraction of a second faster or a little bit louder, you, you, you get the idea, right? So that would be technically yeah, an yeah, alternative yeah. possibility, but it's not a morally relevant alternate possibility. So you wouldn't say that all of a sudden my view has removed all the problems about determinism just because there's an alternate possibility in which there's a slightly different sin. What, ne what is needed in the alternate scenario is a morally better option. And so that's why if you just rescue the ability to do one sin or another, you haven't really rescued moral responsibility on this view. All right, Tim, we're closing in on the end of this, uh, of our time together. <laughs> what do you think about this? Well, here's the deal. Uh, if Joe is determined by something or someone else to murder Frank, right? So in this case if Joe is determined by God to murder Frank, but you know, so, so he couldn't do otherwise there. He couldn't, I mean, so there's the, a moral issue. But God leaves it up to Joe as to how to murder Frank. Well, then Joe possesses libertarian freedom, at least in a limited sense, and thus, Ed, exhaustive divine determinism, is false. Right. So, um, if God leaves it up to Joe to choose you know, between, you know, if, he's, if he determines him to, mur to, to kill or to murder Frank. Right, but leaves it up to Joe as to how he's going to murder him. So Joe has options available, uh, the alternative options, each compatible with his nature at that moment. So uh, Joe can use the Glock, um, he can use the rifle, he can use the knife, he can use the poison. Right, God doesn't determine the mechanism of the murder; should, just determines. Should kill him with kindness. <laughs> <laughs> if he gets one. to choose. Jesus yeah, can't yeah. be upset about that. <laughs> That's right. Let's add kindness to that list. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, moreover, on top of that, we should ask then the Calvinist who's willing to grant this much, if God was surprised by what method Joe freely chose to use to commit mm. the determined murder of Frank. And also mm. ask if God knew that Joe would freely choose to use the Glock to commit the determined murder prior to the foundations of the world. Now, if the Calvinist responds, that of course God, uh, you know, Joe was determined in this moral sense, but God left it open as to if he was going to use the Glock or the rifle or to kill him with kindness. Um, you know, he was free in that sense. Well, then I'm just going to say, well, look, um, yeah, uh, if God did know that Joe would freely choose to use the Glock instead of kindness to commit the determined murder, then mere Molinism is true. Right. If God knew that prior to the foundations of the world and if he wasn't surprised with the free choice of Joe. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, we could say if, if he knew this prior to the foundations of the world, uh, Joe's use of the Glock was predestined, but not determined. Joe has limited libertarian freedom here, and God has middle knowledge of how Joe would freely choose, even if he determined the murder. Well, listen, so. Tim, this has been a blast. And uh, I think we've taken this thing apart in the last several hours. <laughs> and uh, I think it's going to be a great resource, though. I'll add chapters at some point and we'll have you could actually send people to, to particular issues because we ended up covering a lot of terrain and we covered a lot of subjects that even if someone had never seen this debate are still interesting subjects to have the nature of freedom, obviously, um, what free will in heaven uh, versus free will on earth, uh, the nature of sin, original sin, all, all those kind of things are really interesting. And uh, but ultimately, we do want to thank uh, 
the channel that it was this was hosted on the gospel yeah. truth that had that debate mm-hmm. we haven't mentioned that but marlon Mar- definitely marlon needs to- wilson right it's marlon yeah. wilson that's his name yeah that's one of my favorite channels for for debates so i appreciate him and for arranging such a legendary debate and both of these men who as we've said we greatly admire we find to be humorous either intentionally or unintentionally throughout the debate yeah. and <laughs> It was a blast. I learned a lot. So thanks to everybody. And thank you, Tim, for being here today. Thanks for having me. It was. uh, Hey, hey, um, you told me sometime back, it was just in passing, that there's an article coming out that you're drafting with a famous apologist. Who is that? And tell us what that when that's coming out again. Uh, It's it's not just drafted. It's done and it's submitted. Um, And uh, that was uh, the article is called uh an an explanation and a defense of the free thinking argument and uh, it's with the uh, co-authored with jp moreland oh that's right um, yeah yeah some guy <laughs> he's that guy that scales <laughs> secular cities yeah that's right he does all right. scale <laughs> <secular cities. laughs> all right folks this has been a blast tim i'm glad to call you my friend proud to know you mm-hmm. and excited about the things that are coming in the future in your life and ministry. Feelings mutual, brother. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Trinity Radio. Radio.